One, be alive. Good evening. Good evening, all of you. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, special webinar on TAVI. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be have this uh, launch this webinar, a series of webinar, a three week series in association with the Association of Physicians of India. So it's a great pleasure today to have with us the president of API. And I a warm welcome to you, sir. And uh, I would also welcome Dr. Muruganathan as a guest of honor. A warm welcome to you, sir. And uh, now I would request Dr. Muruganathan to uh, take over uh, the inaugural inauguration for this uh, webinar, please. Thank you, Dr. Singhotuvel. Dear brothers and sisters, we had been uh, listening to various webinars on hypertension, diabetes, and every physician should know what are the modalities available for some different and difficult uh, conditions. Now, when we were uh, learning, aortic stenosis means it's usually rheumatic and, and congenital, and we don't know, we'll only give medical treatment. Even the valve replacement surgery was not that popular when we were students. Now, a lot of changes have happened. And uh, once if you have an awareness about this, especially the physician should know if somebody in the echo has got bicuspid aortic valve, you will have to screen them periodically to find out whether they are going for aortic stenosis or aortic uh, uh, regurgitation. So if you don't know, you don't know the awareness. So what mind doesn't know, eyes cannot see. So that is why all physicians should be aware, update their knowledge in various fields, especially medically related fields. Though we don't do anything, uh, TAVI or whatever, but at least we must know when to refer, when to identify, when to suspect. So only that reason, uh, we thought this is going to be a good webinar. And I'm very, very happy. Our president of API, Dr. Kamalesh Tiwari, is a very good academician. He's the past professor of uh, medicine. Uh, Nazreen, can I have his introduction slides, please? Uh, he's a past president of API. Sorry, he's a president of API and past professor of uh, in Mazarpur, Bihar. And, uh, you know, those days, uh, he has to have good connection with a uh, lot of people around even Nepal. So his uh, knowledge and uh, his skill, teaching skill is extraordinary. So even anytime when you talk to him, he'll be very happy to come and you know, address in any topic. Especially he's very much interested and passionate in hypertension. So you can see uh, he's MD FRCP, FRCP uh, Glasgow, and he's an ex-professor of uh, ex professor and HOD Medicine, SK Medical College, Muzaffarpur. Uh, he's the president of Association of Physicians of India, and he's the chairman scientific committee of APCON 2021. Uh, though we could not do a live program, he did a wonderful program, and uh, he had uh, released two big volumes of books, which has got more than 600, 700 articles. And then we had 700 uh, uh, you know, speakers were there. It was a wonderful program. He was also past president of the Hypertension Society of India. He's the director, DO Narayan Hospital Maternity Center, Mosafur, Bihar. Uh, without wasting much time, I would really request our uh, beloved friend and uh, academician, uh, Dr. Kamalesh Tiwari. Uh, and I'm also thankful to him for accepting to be our uh, major partner in this uh, webinar series. So I now request him to give his inaugural address. Over to you, Professor Kamalesh Tiwari, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Mugnathan, my friend, and other dignitaries from the Tavi Association. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this Tavi Association for calling me on this inaugural function. Thank you very much. This Tavi, I mean, transcatheter aortic valve replacement was not there in our time. We were just reading aortic stenosis, aortic stenosis medically and knowing the signs, symptom and treatment medically. But now it is possible that we can do treatment by this transcatheterization of this aortic valve. It is a new development in the science. When we were a student, there was a story that tell me when a boy is playing football in the ground and he collapses, what will be the differential diagnosis? 
and aortic stenosis was first in the differential diagnosis. And that boy was supposed to be the good in the class. But anyway, this is a very important topic and treatment which we have got nowadays is very important. So I think the physicians and surgeons of Tabi will do much better in future as well. And I will wish a very, very good webinar today. With these words, I would like to thank to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kamlesh Tiwari, sir, for your uh, inaugural address. And uh, I'm very happy that you have given your full support to all, to all of us. In fact, uh, most of our speakers are APA members only. Uh, Dr. Nihar Mehta, Dr. Wander, Dr. Sanmo Sundaram, all of them are our, our APA members. And you'll be, uh, you'll be happy to know there are more than 5,400 uh, participants now have joined and registered for this program, which means they are all interested to know about this. So yeah. once again, and once again, thank you, Kamalish sir. And uh, if, if time permits, you can come next time also, next week also. Just be with us. It'll be a great support for all, for all of us when you are there. Uh, thanks for your support and office support, sir. And now I'll uh, invite the chairpersons, my good friend, uh, Dr. Sanmo Sundram, and also um, uh, Dr. Vijay. I don't know whether he has, Vijay has joined us. Uh, I don't think he has joined, but... Uh, He's, Sanmo Sundram. He's there, sir. He's there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Vijay? Okay. Vijay Shankar, how are you? Yeah, so uh, I, I'm happy to uh, invite Dr. Vijay Shankar, a famous cardiothoracic surgeon. In fact, I, my association with him is so, so long, uh, and they, I know his father also. So the, these three char, the, I mean, Sanmo Sundram and Vijay Shankar will be the char persons. And of course, Nihar Mehta is going to be the speaker. I welcome Dr. Aravinda Nanjundapa also from US. Uh, welcome, uh, Nanjundapa. What time is that now in your country? Uh, you unmute, please. Nanjutapa, you unmute, please. Nanjutapa, can you hear me? Please unmute, Nanjutapa. Thank, thank you, sir. Sorry about that, uh, Morgan. Um, this time is now really good. It's nine nine o'clock in the morning, and it's okay, a weekend. Okay, so, okay, so thank so, you, sir, so, invite, and I appreciate uh, Dr. Singh yeah. as well, the, all the organizers. Yeah. So uh, we are very happy that uh, the Sengotu Velu, Vijay Shankar and uh, Muttu, the team, has performed nearly 150 to 200 Tavi. It was great. You know, they started very recently only, but they could do 100, I mean, 150 to 200 in a short time and all successful stories. In fact, uh, I, I'm sorry to say this also because in uh, many of our physicians, they think Tavi, may, I mean, sorry, aortic stenosis means only medical treatment. They don't submit for surgery or I mean, any interventional procedure. Uh, three days back, uh, Sengotu Veli came down to my place, Paimbatur, and did a Tavi. And you know, it was a very critical case. The patient went in for problems and then he re revived and saved him. And now he's back home. So, so within three days, you know, he came and uh, got Tavi uh, got done in Paimbatur. Uh, Sengotu Veli flew from Paimbatur, I mean, Chennai and came here and did that. So Chengotu well also goes to so many places now and does uh, mentoring and doing something. So uh, just for your uh, information, Aravinda Nanyudapa, he's, you know, uh, really uh, uh, doing a lot of good work in Tavi. So uh, with this, I think I will ask Sanmo Sundram as a chairperson to introduce the first speaker, Nihar Mehta, and then we'll start the proceedings. Uh, Sanmo Sundram, over to you to invite uh, Nihar Mehta for the first talk. Can I have a slide, please, for Dr. Nihar? Thank you, Dr. Murugan. Um uh, I should appreciate my um, Dr. Sankar Duvelli for uh, um, nice, um, you know, selection of uh, topics, uh, starting with um, recognition of um, aortic stenosis, both by clinical means as well as by investigatory tools, um, which is very important for uh, choosing a right patient for uh, the treatment. Uh, to address on this issue, uh, we have Dr. Nehar Mehta, um, uh, who is an international cardiologist. Um, now working in uh, Jasla Hospital and Research Center and Bhatia Hospital. Um, I now request um, Dr. Nehar Mehta to uh, tell us about um, the pathophysiology, natural history, and clinical diagnosis of aortic stenosis. Over to you, Mehta. 
thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and uh, thank you uh, api for creating this lovely forum where we can discuss tavi and a special thanks to dr sengot for for getting us all together because uh, tavi is something like dr murugandan said is something which is close to our heart because it does show some fabulous results and some very gratifying results in people who have been labeled as uh, <coughs> you know untreatable so i have been given the task of discussing aortic stenosis and starting from the basics that is the pathophysiology natural history and the clinical diagnosis so i think this is a very important uh, uh, topic because unless we have a foundation straight we can never have any uh, build up to the the aortic stenosis treatment and tabor so it's it's very important that we understand the pathophysiology and natural history so that we know which patients need to be treated which can be waited on and which need uh, uh, need no treatment at all so uh, the, the talk that i i will have today is going to be more in terms of how we can select our patients how we can um, uh, uh, you know determine which patients are for which sort of treatment now as you know aortic stenosis is the narrowing of the aortic valve orifice which leads to the obstruction of the left ventricular outflow this eventually leads to a pressure hypertrophy of the left ventricle which is always progressive and slowly progressive and the classical triad of symptoms are angina dyspnea and syncope eventually if this is not treated it will lead to death of the patient uh this is a disease which is more and more common with aging it is very rare to see this in a person less than 50 years old um there are certain terminologies which we will start off with because once we understand these we will know how uh, uh, the severity of aortic uh, stenosis progresses in the beginning in degenerative aortic stenosis there is aortic valve sclerosis where there is just thickening and calcification of the aortic valve but the gradients are low and the velocities are less than 2 meters per second once the velocity crosses 2 meters per second we start calling it mild moderate or severe aortic stenosis severe is when that velocity crosses 4 meters per second and that correlates with an aortic valve area of less than 1 cm square and very severe aortic stenosis is when the velocity goes even higher more than 5 meters per second and critical aortic stenosis is when the area indexed area per uh, meter square of body surface area goes below 0.6 so this is the way aortic stenosis progresses and usually for all patients it goes in these stages in a very slow and step wise manner now aortic stenosis or left ventricular outflow tract obstruction can occur at various levels it can be supravalvular valvular and subvalvular the subvalvular variety we know of as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or subvalvular rings but we are going to restrict our discussion to valvular aortic stenosis in the valvular subset the congenital ones are the most important one amongst that is bicuspid aortic valve and i'll come to that uh, subsequently in our country is rheumatic aortic stenosis and of course the most common worldwide is degenerative aortic stenosis including in our country now congenital aortic stenosis is unicuspid or bicuspid where the valve normally the instead of three cusps we have only two in bicuspid or in unicuspid two of the raphias are fused and you have a single cusp uh, aortic valve this leads to a lot of flow dynamics and the calcification occurs much earlier and this is one very common cause of aortic stenosis although in in india rheumatic is common but bicuspid aortic valves are very common in the asian subcontinent um coming to rheumatic heart disease rheumatic heart disease is the fusion of the commissures whether it's the mitral or aortic important thing to know is that in rheumatic aortic stenosis the mitral valve is by and large always involved and the patients will always have some mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis in degenerative uh, aortic valve stenosis there is the calcification of the trileaflet valve and this is the most common variety there are a lot of rarer causes like sle and pages disease and end stage renal disease which causes a more rapid calcification and you do see these uh, ckd patients who are coming at a younger age with calcified trileaflet valves um coming to the epidemiology you know it's important that like i said this is a disease of aging if you'll see from the age of 50 to 90 the percentage of people who have aortic stenosis 
goes up subsequently significantly and by the age of 80 and 90 at least 10% of our octogenarians are going to have aortic stenosis that's a large number especially with the aging population going higher and higher this this um uh, data set is more from patients who underwent aortic replacement and as we go ahead you know we do realize that below 50 it's more congenital the bicuspids between 50 and 70 also bicuspids are more common but as you cross 70 the the tricuspid valve the degenerative tricuspid valve stenosis becomes more and more common now coming to the hemodynamics uh it's important to know that aortic stenosis is a gradually developing disease which develops over years and this allows the heart to remain silent and lets people tolerate aortic stenosis quite well for a long time but progression does occur in majority of these patients and what do we mean by this is that when the aortic valve stenosis progresses the area slowly becomes smaller and smaller as the area becomes smaller the gradients across this valve will get higher and higher normally if our area is 3 to 4 cm square of the aortic valve until it's half below this that is around 1.5 cm square patients may not have any problem the velocity will stay normal the gradients will stay normal but then there is that tipping point following which the uh, gradients and the area will start uh, the gradients will start increasing now why is it that in spite of this we don't have problems is because of the lv the lv has a tremendous capacity to adapt the concentric hypertrophy pro uh, process needs to increase in the wall thickness and leads to normal wall stress now what is this to say easily it's like if a door is jammed if we are going to push it hard the door will open and that is what our lv is doing it's hypertrophied it's increasing its power to push that valve open and that's why it adapts the ejection fraction the end diastolic volumes cardiac output stroke volumes all stay steady despite increasing gradients because of the lv but eventually the lv will not compensate and eventually the long standing pressure overload will lead to ventricular dilatation and decrease in systolic function now diastolic dysfunction is an important aspect of this because far before systolic dysfunction occurs patients have dyspnea majority of it is because of diastolic dysfunction the increase in the left ventricular end diastolic pressures and this will reflect into the pulmonary circulation this occurs because of a prolonged ventricular relaxation time a thick non compliant ventricle myocardial ischemia especially subendocardial ischemia is very common increase in the afterload and very important is that in spite of correcting the aortic valve stenosis if there is persistent interstitial fibrosis of the myocardium then this diastolic dysfunction may persist and can trouble people even later <clears throat> a few words about this very special entity called low flow low gradient aortic stenosis and why is this important because we must understand it and identify it because this is a, a entity which will confuse us and trick us into thinking that the aortic stenosis is not severe so this happens when our heart goes into that end stage where the compensatory hypertrophy is not enough and therefore the left ventricle starts dilating as the left ventricle cannot handle the stress uh, an afterload mismatch occurs and the ejection fraction drops now when the ejection fraction drops the ventricle cannot generate enough force and therefore the gradients which we get are not as high as you would expect in severe aortic stenosis in this situation the myocytes are normal it is just the lv is tired it's not being able to match that afterload and therefore the myocyte function being normal is still causing a reduced ef therefore if you replace the valve the patient gets better however there is also an entity of uh, uh, where the patient has a underlying lv dysfunction either cardiomyopathy cardiac fibrosis ischemic heart disease where the heart is diseased and the lv cannot generate enough force to open the aortic valve so it's not that the gradients across the aortic valve are high aortic stenosis may be mild but here the myocyte function itself is abnormal here if we change the valve it's not going to affect the lv and in these patients it's important to say look here the aortic valve should not be replaced because it's the lv which is at fault now how do you differentiate with between these two in true aortic stenosis like i said the gradients will be low but the aortic stenosis is still severe and therefore the the lv which has 
dropped its ejection fraction cannot generate the stroke volume and the gradients but in pseudo aortic stenosis the cardiac output is low because of the weak lv and therefore the valve cannot open the mobility of the valve is limited by the lack of the force and therefore it is mistaken to be taken as moderate or severe aortic stenosis but it is not something which needs treatment and surgical correction will not benefit in these patients a couple of words on bicuspid aortic valve and uh, this is actually one of the most con common congenital heart diseases present in close to 1 to 2% of the population in general complications are both aortic stenosis and regurgitation but important to know that it happens earlier close to a decade earlier than degenerative aortic stenosis and a uh, important aspect of this is that 30% of these people do need aortic root surgery also they have aortopathy so when we come across a patient with bicuspid aortic valve we shouldn't blindly refer them for replacement we should look at their aorta aortas to see do they need a surgical replacement of the valve including the root because that will that is an important aspect of treatment here there is a different classification for bicuspid aortic valves and that includes the severe classification where in this you can see the valve has only uh, has no raphes but there are two separate valve cusps here there is one rafe which is fused this is the most common variety it's seen in close to 85 90% and the other is where the two rafes are fused and this is like a unicuspid valve so this is the the the, the classification of bicuspid aortic valves now coming to natural history how will our patients present how will they behave how how do they come to us remember that these patients have a prolonged asymptomatic period you rarely come across an aortic stenosis who comes all of a sudden with the most critical aortic stenosis in general the symptoms of the patient are very few initially especially when the left ventricular function is normal um some patients do become symptomatic early but they usually when they are associated with other problems like aortic regurgitation or associated valves now so many patients will develop uh, symptoms uh, before the onset of left ventricular systolic dysfunction but some of these patients they will come to us only after the lv function has gone down now remember here the heart function the heart is hypertrophied so your lv functions will actually be 65% higher than 60% and in these patients even if your heart functioning goes down to 50 50% or so that is a reduction in the lv function this is that transition point where if not treated here they will lead to a significant drop in ejection fraction and overt heart failure so when you see an aortic stenosis patient with a ejection fraction of 50% it should immediately raise our antenna to there being a problem in that patient's uh, cardiac status how do these valves progress remember i said that the uh, the valves are slow progressing and this is an idea of that that over over every year the gradients increase only by around 3 to 7 mm of mercury and we want a gradient of over 40 mean for us to call it severe aortic stenosis the reduction of area is 0.1 cm square per year now when this is 3 cm square it's very mild but when it starts going to 1.5 and 1 then each 0.1 is very very important similarly the jet velocity around goes up by 0.3 meter per second per year in mild aortic stenosis where your jet velocities are less than 3 you are unlikely to develop symptoms at least over the next 5 years however when patients are asymptomatic with severe aortic stenosis meaning they have severe gradients small areas but they are no they have no complaints because of the compensated lv they don't do well they the event free survival at 2 years is only around 50 to 60% but at 4 to 5 years only 20 to 30% of these people have not had some problem so far and this is a chart to depict the same that when you're mild you may survive for 5 years without a problem but the second you become severe then every year there is an event which occurs for our patients so we don't need to wait for these events to occur but these severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis patients we should keep a very close watch on and treat them early a lot of uh, factors can increase the progression or the risk of progression some of them are given here like uh, the calcification the the valve stenosis the area the age gender uh, the cause of aortic stenosis uh, renal insufficiency hypercalcemia uh, diabetes and this is a chart which shows just how aortic calcification progresses 
when the valve calcification is mild the progression is not so rapid but the second you have moderate to severe calcification once again the progression over years becomes quite rapid i think this is probably the most important slide because this slide is going to tell us how our patients behave and how it affects them to change the aortic valve symptomatic severe aortic stenosis patients who do not undergo a change at the correct time will immediately start getting heart failure syncope or angina and the second they develop these symptoms their survival drops to 5 4 and 2 years 5 3 and 2 years so the second you have symptoms from the asymptomatic stage your prognosis will drastically go down to just a couple of years but at that point if you have your valve replaced then your your life expectancy goes back to normal it gets back on track so this is a very very important slide mortality in patients with as dramatically decrease increases after they have developed symptoms and this observation along with the improved survival after valve replacement is the basis for our recommendation to replace valves at the correct time for most of these patients now the stages of aortic stenosis we are we have been discussing this but the first two stages this is a very lovely chart given by the american guidelines where patients at risk or asymptomatic have either mild or moderate aortic stenosis with lower velocities less than 4 usually the ejection fractions are normal as they progress to asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis the velocities go above 4 and they still maintain normal ejection fractions some of them may develop a low ejection fraction like i said below 50% it doesn't have to be drastically low and these patients should be treated earlier as you get symptomatic this is the subset of patients who need the fastest care where the velocities go above 4 the subset the d2 and d3 subsets which are symptomatic but low ef are the ones which are confusing which will confuse us because the gradients may not be very high but this team the area will be very low and the answer to this is the dobutamine stress echo uh, i'll come to that but the dobutamine echo should be done to make sure that these patients have a better outcome the symptoms we've discussed uh, once they develop angina 5 years is the survival syncope 3 years and with heart failure it's only 2 years but remember our patients are going to have a decreased exercise tolerance and dyspnea on exertion as more common symptoms than these classical symptoms and the mechanism is quite uh, uh, you know very much related to the workload on the lv and the oxygen consumption but once they get angina their expectancy is only going to be 5 years syncope is, pre uh, is precipitated by a baroreceptor mediated vasodilatation and by the decreased stroke out, uh, output and their survival drops to only 3 years and heart failure is most often with a preserved ejection fraction that is our diastolic classical diastolic heart failure and there the prognosis becomes dismal so majority of patients are asymptomatic you may find a very prominent injection systolic murmur classical triad of symptoms rarely they have end stage cardiac ecchexia and anasarca a common problem with these patients is coagulation abnormalities low platelets von willebrand factor deficiencies and uh, as many as 20% of untreated patients have clinical bleeding there's a syndrome called hedy syndrome which is a disorder characterized by aortic stenosis angiodysplasia and gi bleeds and acquired von willebrand factor uh, abnormality just should be kept in mind when we are treating our patients uh, don't let's not forget our physical examination low volume parve set tardis pulse decapitation of the bp an s4 a systolic thrill going to the carotids the classical crescendo decrescendo murmur and uh, the later the peak the more it is always remember the gallivardin phenomenon where the murmur is, is radiating to the apex in i'm not going to focus a lot on the diagnostics uh, especially the ekg and x-ray because the most common thing you get is left ventricular hypertrophy and in the x-ray you get a calcified uh, valve and a dilated ascending aorta but the cornerstone of treatment is your is of the diagnosis is echo where you can diagnose everything from your severity the morphology the lv the rv concomitant other lesions even initially sizing was done by echos but of course now it is done with a ct scan so an echo is the most important diagnostic tool that we have and these are the velocities like i said about 4 meter square and mean of 40 millimeters of mercury goes into the severe category uh 
how often should we do echoes for a mild aortic stenosis every 3 to 5 years moderate every 1 to 2 years years but once it's severe it must be done at least 6 months to a year even if they are asymptomatic the dobutamine echo which is the stress echo we always wonder should we stress our aortic stenosis patients and the answer is that only for those who have a low ejection fraction you can use a dobutamine echo where it will differentiate between these categories of two and pseudo severe aortic stenosis and also give us an idea about the contractile reserves exercise stress testing should be done with very much with a lot of care only in those true borderline cases where other safer tests according to me can also be used like a ct like a transesophageal echo and other biomarkers the ct scan is essential when it comes to planning our procedures it gives us tremendous information when we come to our tavi talks you will realize how every single one of these is important to make our plan set for the tavi it is now standard of care and it is the most important test which makes all our decisions very easy when it comes to uh, aortic stenosis planning and it gives you information all from your your approach to your valve it gives you ideas of the calcification and the, the type of valve the bicuspid valve as you can see here and the the approach the lv gives us tremendous amount of information catheterization is now really not needed prior to a tavi you do need a coronary angiogram but uh, intra cardiac gradients are not as accurate as they were thought to be earlier and not really required to do a catheterization every time to summarize patients with aortic stenosis are generally asymptomatic for a prolonged period of time we need to follow them up regularly the adaptation of the lv allows us to to maintain a normal cardiac output and lv function diastolic dysfunction is an important factor especially for heart failure and especially the heart failure with normal ejection fraction classical triad of heart failure and angina and syncope is there but more commonly people will have a decreased exercise tolerance cutting off their activities dyspnea on exertion and dizziness mortality dramatically increases after development of cardiac symptoms prompt attention is required even when mild symptoms develop because from there the patients will have a rapid downhill course and it's important that we know that medical management is a gives you a very very poor prognosis the cornerstones of of diagnosis are 2d echoes and a ct scan is absolutely essential prior to planning the tavi thank you so much thank you thank doctor. you doctor oh, sorry okay no, no, go ahead go ahead sir no, no, sorry thank you dr neha mitra for the nice overview about um, uh, the pathophysiology and uh, you know recognition of um, aortic stenosis uh, dr sangeet well uh, why don't we keep uh, the questions um, at the end you know if uh, dr yeah. sangeet yeah. is going to stay with us till the end uh, why not we have all the questions at the end is it all right sure sure it will be good also so that you know uh, all collectively we can ask uh, questions because nigar mehta's uh, talk has opened so many Uh, so doubt so we'll be asking him so uh, I, i request nigar mehta to stay back now i think vijay will uh, call, uh, introduce aravind nanjudupa and then he'll uh, yeah. vijay are you there vijay uh, dr dr uh, aravind nanjudupa let me uh, let me introduce uh, dr nan and thank you dr nehar was a fantastic uh, very clear presentation and uh, nehar is a uh, a busy interventional cardiologist doing a lot of tavi in mumbai so thank you dr nehar so now dr arvind nanjandupa uh, is from charleston the us so he's an interventional cardiologist he does a lot of uh, structural work uh, does mitral valve uh, aortic valve interventions uh, he also comes to india to proctor cases so he's been great friend of us and uh, it's great to have you here uh, so i would welcome and uh, ask dr nanjandupa to give his talk Dr. Sangat Velu, thank you so much. It's a pleasure and honor to uh, be part of this, and I sincerely appreciate it. And uh, as uh, previous speakers were talking, uh, we saw a quick rise in Dr. Sangat Velu doing seventy cases from year to two hundred. And uh, I've seen his work personally because we work closely for India Wells and other meetings at our Polo. Also, very good skill set. More than skill set, what I like is he thinks about the patient and not just. do another tavar for me i think uh, in america right now everybody wants to do the tavar including my 8 year old daughter because the first thing i hire a new person is i want to do tavar but uh, tavar is like um, marriage i tell the patient if, uh, other physicians it's uh, comes in all ways 
it's easy to do the tavar there's not much think uh, much physical skill but uh, a lot of it is mental patient selection patient's outcomes durability how do i manage it but it's a lifelong problem afterwards the patient will be back to you for every little bit thing and they think it's the valve that's moved if they tip their toes if uh, they cough they think the valve is ejected so you, it's a lifelong problem to deal with but unfortunately younger generation don't realize it they think this is a new girl in the town they want to date but uh, tavar is a lifetime uh, commitment so i really appreciate and upload uh, dr sangathwelu for taking on this and of course there are a lot of operators in india who done a really good job i'm going to share the screen and see if we can uh, start the program dr sangathwelu can you ask them to allow me to share the screen please yeah okay yeah Yeah. Can you see the screen, please? Yes, you know we can see it. Okay, uh, I want to make a quick um, disclosure that I don't have any commitment to any companies or valves or anything like that. Uh, however, th- some of these slides I did share from uh, some of the physicians from Duke who put in uh, some of the conferences in the past, but uh, nothing is proprietary that I'm talking. So this is a nice topic in the present day. Is it TAVR or surgical AVR or is it medical management? Which modality for which patient? I think uh, Dr. Nihar already told uh, quickly in a summary that uh, medical management is just a dismal outcome. I do agree with him. So TAVR, which patient for the native well? Uh, severe symptomatic and at least uh, class one. a class 2 new york heart association should be there this is the medicare requirement in the united states to get a approval and patient can be high risk intermediate risk and now even low risk patients have been contr- uh, contributing to tavar uh, load echo criteria as we talked about valve area should be less than 0.9 mean gradient greater than 40 vmax of more than 4 meter squared if the patient has a low flow low gradient uh, additional calcium score may help this number is all over the place initially they said 2400 for men and then uh, 1500 for women i think partho sen gupta lately said uh, the numbers can be lower less more than 2000 in men and 1200 in women but i'll give a word of caution yes it's included in the guidelines you could use this but you need to have a calibration in your lab exactly to look at how much calcification is in the aorta and they have to put a dot on the aorta i'm not an expert on the imaging but uh, it you have to justify in your own lab do 10 to 20 of them and then go back and correlate and say hey does this work in our own lab it wasn't correlating unless we until we got some specialists so then we realized that we were not counting it good and especially looking at the calcium score for somebody like me who wants to fix all the valves with tavar i'm just looking for an excuse to do it so you really need to put the patient at the center not my own ambitions and uh, try to keep it uh, uh clean because if you have a heavy calcification around the area you could pick it up and add for the calcium score at the same time women may have fibrotic disease their calcium score may be less than 1200 that does not mean she does not have aortic stenosis so you need to look at other ones so we call it the classical low flow and then there is paradoxical low flow what we mean by that is the ef is still normal but the flow of the gradients are still low so in this case it also calcium score does help both the categories in 2014 and 2019 guidelines uh, they did mention that you could use a dobutamine or sometimes exercise a co if needed to, to pick up the gradients of course this is all for native well we're talking about so additional testing <clears throat> you could also do the invasive hemodynamics in the cath lab nihar already mentioned this is really not accurate we used to think it's very accurate now echo is still a very good standard and if you don't even you could use tee and some places use mri to see the flow dynamics i think cleveland even uh, measures the valves based on the mri and 3d tee in patients with high k- kidney function but uh, they need expertise and they need validation in your own lab in our lab sometimes i do use sodium nitroproside based on data from mayo clinic uh, i think uh, chitri hall and them uh, have a nice protocol you start at the nitroproside at 0.5 and go up to 20 or make sure the patient doesn't have a vasodilatation and blood pressure drop but this in a paradoxical low flow gradient you can nicely elicit a gradient in the lab of course you need to have a dual lumen catheter or at least one catheter in the pigtail one in the aorta and then do it uh, no pull back or nothing like aorta and the femoral gradients a good history from the family member is very es- uh, essential i think in the india also it's the same issue but in the united states what we are seeing is men especially have a little bit of more ego on the macho 
uh, mentality. They say, I have no problems, I have no symptoms. And then I ask them, then why are you here in my office? So somebody sent me. And then in two weeks, the patient is back with CHF. Kind of they're in a denial. And uh, if I don't get a good history, they'll be telling me I walked for two miles. When did you walk? It's 20 years ago, not yesterday. You know? So I, uh, I've been <clears throat> caught with uh, this, these issues many times. And you've got to get a really good history, especially from their spouse or from the family members. People with memory issues also may not be knowing how bad they are, and they can tell that um, they've been having a uh, very good uh, health history where truly it is not. So in our clinics, what we do is we keep a five meter walk test. We have a nurse who can walk them to see their frailty. If they're walking with a walker or a um, <clears throat> walking stick, I know that already meets the criteria for frailty. More data is coming up from uh, additional centers. Uh, one of the good colleague, Emil Gada, who does a really good number of towers, has adapted the six-minute walk test in Pittsburgh and uh, Harrisburg, where if the patient can't walk in six minutes, they're not going to be doing well with the tower in terms of 30-day outcomes and one-year outcomes. At the end of the day, it's the clinical judgment from the physician uh, who, in case of selections. In terms of TAVR for a valve in valve, we talked about native valve, but for valve in valve, it's for degenerated bioprosthetic valve with the symptoms of at least New York Association class two. The mean gradient here, the valve area and the VMAX may not meet the criteria, but that doesn't mean uh, that patient does not have degenerated valve. You really have to cl closely take a look at uh, associated aortic regurgitation and structural degeneration noted on the TE surface echo also noted on uh, a CT scan, careful symptom evaluation, because sometimes the mean gradients may not be that much, but patient has significant symptoms. As long as it's from the valve, it will help you to, to take care of the patient. They may need additional testing, such as dobutamine echo and exercise echo. And remember, if a degenerated bioprosthetic valve comes to the hospital, sending him home usually does not work because they'll be right back or they can even die. The mortalities are high. Invasive hemodynamics in the cath lab with sodium nitroprusside or dobutamine may help these patients too. Prosthetic valve uh, stenosis. Um, sorry about that. Um, but the prosthetic valve stenosis uh, or intervention um, uh, re repeat. The valve replacement is indicated for severe symptomatic degeneration, that's class one. In patients with suspected bioprosthetic valve in whom the hemodynamics are stable, have no contraindication to anticoagulation, initial uh, anticoagulation is reasonable. These are patients where we are suspecting HALT, which is hypoattenuated leaflet thickening, or where patients have a, a fused valves and we can treat them with anticoagulation and see, but you need to document that on a 3D TE or a 4D CT scan. And for severe symptomatic patients with bioprosthetic valve stenosis that is judged by the heart team to be at high risk for uh, reoperation, a valve in valve is reasonable. That's 2A. And Dr. Sangatwilo, I'm sorry if I muted myself. Can you hear me? Hello? I are able to hear you. Yes, sir. Anjali can hear you. I'm Utu here. Okay. Sorry about that. So prosthetic valve stenosis intervention level one guidelines is for symptomatic patients. And the new two categories of 2A is if you suspect a halt or a thickening of the valve leaflets or fusion, you could try anticoagulation. But if you have severely symptomatic bioprosthetic valve stenosis that is determined by CT surgery and yourself, and if you feel that this is all coming from the valve. It's reasonable to do a valve in valve in these patients, even if the hemodynamics uh, are not meeting the criteria. So further pro prosthetic valve regurgitation for intervention as by guidelines by AHA that was published in uh, circulation. <clears throat> Percutaneous uh, paravalvular regurgitation in patients who are symptomatic if they have hemolysis and the uh, anatomy is suitable, that's a class 2A indication. For severely symptomatic uh, bioprosthetic valve regurgitation judged by the heart team and uh, you think the valve in valve is helpful, that's also reasonable to do a valve in valve TAVI. Now, clinical trials for options for TAVR patients who are asymptomatic, what do you do with them? 
uh, especially if the way, uh, patients have a Vmax of more than five meters squared, we know the data from long time, these patients don't do well. So such patients, we have a clinical trial called early tower. As Nihar mentioned, these patients, we do exercise them in a modified bruise protocol. If they walk for seven minutes, they're truly asymptomatic. This number is very low. I do agree with Nihar. But such patients, we put them on a uh, clinical trial where patients are randomized to either medical treatment or uh, valve uh, revascularization. Out of three years, I was only able to find uh, three patients, I believe, two underwent TAVAR and one of them is on a medical treatment. This always makes me nervous because if what if something happens at home, but right now they're okay. But you can see for, uh, for a large center, having three patients enrolled is a very low number. And low flow, low state, what do we do if they don't meet the criteria, all this, but they keep having symptoms? So we do have a clinical trial called Unload TAVAR. Hopefully, we can prove that we're doing a TAVR in these patients with low ejection fraction, as long as EF is about 20, but they keep coming back with CHF, we may benefit these patients. So concerns about TAVR, especially in the <clears throat> low risk trials <clears throat> and low risk patient is paravalve regurgitation and the pacemaker risk. This is always a concern because the numbers have been high, but I think nowadays with both Evolute and the Evolute Pro Plus and the S3 having that extra cuff, and uh, even the accurate NEO having a bulky cuff, the paravalve leaks are coming down and the deployment techniques have been changing. The Medtronic is pushing heavily for the cusp overlap technique where you isolate the non coronary cusp and you overlap the left and right cusp and you deploy it way high without touching the membrane septum. It's almost like one to two millimeters below the annulus. We have a clinical trial for that. The paravalve leaks are less, pacemaker risk are low. You can even um, achieve the pacemaker risk of the Evolute well close to S3. But even to make it <coughs> tougher, S3 valves also, somebody like Samir Kapadia has been doing a different way to place them, a similar cusp overlap technique, but also not look at the center dot. They do it with uh, one and a half uh, length of that dark line and the uh, light line. The deployment is way high, but uh, as long as you do it carefully, the pacemaker risks are much lower and also the para value leaks are low. So a lot of new techniques have been done to improve the outcomes. Coronary uh, occlusion is an issue, but uh, again, there is a uh, commissural alignment done both for Evolute and uh, Edwards valve. Even when you prep it, you could uh, look at your CT scan and place the where the coronaries are going to come off. So all these are going to improve the valve performance and longevity. In terms of anatomical consideration, bicuspid aortic valve, I think Nihar spoke very elegantly about problems of the bicuspid valve and uh, high amount of uh, high incidence of bicuspid in the Asia. And this is a concern for me for the TAVR, and I always give them the first option if they're especially young in the ages of 40 to 50. Hey, do you want to consider getting a surgical valve replacement, especially if your aorta is large enough with the uh, aortopathy? And the young patients who are going to be at uh, 40, 50 years, if they have a long life expectancy, how many times are we going to do this? Especially the core valve, that's a concern. So tower in bicuspid valve, you can see, uh, as uh, Nihar mentioned about the seaward classification and uh, the problems with it, it is it's more oval, a larger annulus, potential for elliptical deployment, having more PVLs, especially if the leaflet calcification and leaflet burden is all on one cusp. Concomitant aortic pathology, we're not going to address it unless somebody is at age 70 years and uh, ascending aorta is four centimeters. I may still go by and do the tower. I'm not sure that's the right thing I'm doing. And aortic insufficiency in a non calcified bicuspid valve, if it's not well treated with tower, this is absolutely true, especially even if you pre dilate this and then do the valve, especially with a Medtronic, you could uh, slide the valve down deeper and then you need to get into trouble. And then I've gone back to put an Edwards valve and I feel bad about the patients because why did I do the two valves in young person and how long this is going to happen? And the PVLs are sometimes can be hard to treat. So the best way to choose a patient for TAVAR uh, in uh, my humble opinion is uh, clinical indications, valve durability. You need to think about it because each time we can, uh, the new valves are coming out within a few years. I can't put a number to this and say, hey, the valve is going to last this long. It's all based on uh, hypothetical testing. Risk of pacemaker is an important aspect, but you can reduce the pacemaker risk by new techniques. The age of the patient, uh, patient also matters because how many times are we going to do valve in valve? Frailty is the biggest thing. If a patient has, is frail, uh, I think TAVAR is much better than a, a SAVAR. 
a heart team approach to have a combined decision between a cardiologist and CT surgeon is good. We also have a new um, platform called shared decision making. This is basically to say, hey, do you have a form wherein the patient says he understands what is meant by TAVAR, or he understands what is meant by SAVAR, and also patient had an adequate time to make the important decision. This is a tough one because patients mostly go with what we say, whether the patient is in India or in America, but uh, it's kind of a tool that may justify as far as what we are doing, but in some educated patients, it may make some difference. So choice of TAVAR or TAVAR, uh, in terms of the guidelines in the flow chart, what the AHA recommends is if it is low risk, surgical AVR is still class one, but however, intermediate risk, TAVAR may be 2A and uh, high risk is class one, of course, and prohibitive risk is class one. But with the low risk, again, it's a patient choice with a shared decision making and with the heart team approach. A non bicuspid valve at age 60 years, if we have a cutoff at about 65 in my hospital, and uh, if the patient is at 65 and he wants to have it done, we still do TAVAR. But however, age is just a number for me because there are several 80 year old patients who are really fit versus a 50 year old patient who doesn't get out of the bed and walk. He may benefit from TAVAR than a SAVAR. So it's a clinical decision at the end of the day. So surgical valve replacement timing of the treatment for aortic stenosis should be primarily based on the LV function. You do not want to wait for the LV function to go down just because he does not have symptoms. So here is where surgery comes to a big role. If the LV function is down and even the patient is, doesn't have symptoms, you could get the AVR done. And class one recommendation for aortic valve surgery in symptomatic patients with severe, severe aortic regurgitation, which we don't have a indication yet. And regardless of the LV function, in asymptomatic patients with severe regurgitation and LV dysfunction, you could get aortic valve surgery done. The threshold for intervention are always lower in surgery because of the durability of the surgical valve. So they always are a little bit one step ahead of our uh, TAVAR. Assessing the aortic valve by surgery or by cardiologist is very important to use any of the scores, either ASTS or a Euro score. And uh, I think for Asia, they're coming up with their own scoring system. It's still not validated, but South Korea is working on it, which will be valuable because what happens in the West and in Europe may not apply to the Asian population. So roughly uh, STS score more than eight is considered to be high risk. We know about this four to eight is intermediate and low risk is less than four. But sometimes this score doesn't mean much unless you do a frailty assessment. You could do it with a five meter walk test. You could do it with a hand grip. You could uh, make the patient to get out of the bed and make yourself walk or a six minute walk test. Look at other parameters such as albumin level associated uh, comorbidities such as liver disease, kidney disease, all this will play an important role. So TAVAR versus SAVAR in 2020, this is uh, verbatim from uh, one of the surgeons from Duke. Favoring TAVAR is intermediate or low, greater risk. Isolated AVRs, AVR with coronary artery disease that's favorable for PCI. Porcelain aorta, patient with chest radiation deformity, previous sternotomy, oxygen dependent frailty and small annulus. I would add to this uh, low risk patient also who wants to have an uh, TAVAR done and also is at the good anatomy wherein at age 65, if it lasts for 10 years and then you need to come back and do a valve in valve, it's reasonable. And remember patients with aortic stenosis don't have the same life expectancy as other people. So that's something to keep in mind. Favoring SAVAR is combined AVR with complex coronary artery disease or cabbage or associated mitral valve replacement and uh, ascending aortic aneurysm disease, patients with concomitant aortic regurgitation, Although you AS and AI can also be treated with TAVAR, we all know about it. Patients with endocarditis, young patients who need a mechanical valve, low risk, uh, low, low coronary heights, patients with small sinuses of Valsalva and low coronary height takeoff where coronary risk obstruction is a real issue. So in terms of medical management, truly there is none. Um, it just doesn't come from me, but uh, just two years ago when, uh, People who write the guidelines like Blaise Carabello were asked to give a lecture. He put in one single slide saying that there's no real medical management for valvular heart disease, which is true. However, symptoms can be managed with diuretics for CHF. Chest pain, do a cardiac catheterization. You may need to fix coronaries if chest pain is truly coming from the valve, or from the coronary disease and not from the valve stenosis. 
syncope, if it is from a heart block, you could treat with pacemaker, but however, high mean gradients and high Vmax may cause syncope also. Beta blockers for concomitant CHF and coronary artery disease, there is some role. Statins really does not uh, reverse the aortic stenosis. These trials have been done by uh, Fuster for a long time. Valentin Fuster didn't show any difference. However, in our own center and also some of the data, which is all retrospective, you got to put it with a grain of salt has shown patients with coronary artery disease and cerebrovascular disease. If you put them on statin, they may have a better mortality benefit after TAVR uh, or surgical valve replacement, but that's true. Almost statins should be in uh, tap water because people who take statins definitely live longer and have lesser events. So that's where statins come. One last slide about balloon aortic valvoplasty for aortic stenosis. We do that as a bridge to TAVR or SAVR. And uh, frail patients whom I don't know which way they will land, if they have a hip fracture and they're bedridden, instead of doing a valve, and then we don't know how the patient will fare, we do a balloon valvoplasty just to clear them for surgery and also just for the patient to get a rehab. Symptomatic aortic stenosis, but does not meet the criteria for surgical candidate, nor for TAVR, but we're trying to figure out the CHF is from the LV dysfunction or from the valve. We may do a balloon uh, valvoplasty. You could use a cardiac MRI for um, scar tissue that may help to differentiate also. And for palliative care patients, sometimes the aortic stenosis is so bad, the family wants to just take them home for a few days. We may do the BAV for such patients. In patients, we're trying to avoid doing the TAVR because we figured out in patients, despite doing the TAVR, may have a higher mortality at 30 days and one year. So for these patients, we're trying to do balloon velloplasty if it's feasible and then get them to go home, go ahead for the rehab and come back for the TAVR. So just in the interest of the time, I'll stop here and uh, at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nanjudappa, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, stay tuned with us uh, for the uh, interactive discussion. Now I have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Muthu, uh, who is going to have an interactive session. Uh, can I have Muthu's uh, introductory slide, please, Nazreen? Doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, Dr. Muthu Kumaran is the pediatric and adult structural in uh, intervention cardiologist, Apollo Children's Hospital, Chennai. Worked in pediatric cardiology, uh, Southampton Hospital, UK, neonatal department, Royal Halsmeyer Hospital, Sheffield, currently working in Apollo, Chennai. He also forms a group with uh, Dr. Sengotwale and uh, helps him in the uh, travel. And he is going to talk to us on the workup evaluation of patient. It's going to be an interactive session, so I have a pleasure to introduce. I mean, to introduce as well as to invite him to give his talk. Muthu Kumar. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction, sir. Um, thank you for the organizers really trying to allow everybody to uh, organize the wonderful meeting. And uh, our journey with Tavar started about four or five years ago, and it's really you know done a lot of uh, twists and turns, and we have done more than 150 valves, and its, it's journey has taught us a lot of lessons. And it's nice to uh, share experience and say, um, can I start staring my slides? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, most of my talk has been discussed before, so I want to be, be more interactive to give a scenario how we, um, sorry. Um, how we sort of, you know, work up a patient for a, for a TAVI procedure or how we really go about in managing these patients. So that's the, my topic is going to be. So uh, I'll be involving Dr. S. Vijay Shankar, Dr. Shanmung Sundaram and all the panelists uh, to have an idea how does we how do we really approach a patient who comes in with severe aortic stenosis? Um, so this slide has been shown before. So the aortic stenosis is a very huge problem uh, has been in US and uh, in in India we can see that there's a growing um, um, awareness of this aortic stenosis. And if you see the some amount of cases we're going to see in the next five years, it's going to be enormous as we live more and more into our 70s. 
and um, rightly said that no our number of cases we see um uh, has increased and number of referrals have increased with iatic stenosis and in we we intervene on more people now and so there is 138866 cases which can progress in next 5 years and there's enormous number of cases going to come to us and we should have a consensus in knowing how we going to manage these cases how we are going to do it and uh, whether to medically manage or uh, or uh, surgically manage or put a tower and there's a nice um, talk by dr nanju dabba that's i mean that's really nice talk open lot of you know eyes on uh, how do we really ma manage these cases so um, it's a life threatening uh, we see saw this uh, slide already very very bad prognosis and once you saw the uh, symptoms the survival is very Uh, the, the prognosis is very bad, so we have to really promptly intervene in all these cases, and um, and you can see the mortality via severe inoperable AS is very very um, poor compared to even a lot of cancers. So it's very important that we understand the magnitude of the problem is very very severe. Once we know they have an AS, they should be on continuous um, follow up. telling them what to look for and once symptoms starts happening we should intervene with them as soon as possible because once they went to cardiac failure pulling them back putting a, a valve in them will not give them the same survival so it's very important that we need to understand the real issue here and so we need to really look on to these patients and follow them properly so again it aortic valve replacement improves survival is all this side again so what we see in a patient when came so one comes to us by refer by different physicians regarding uh, uh, with aortic stenosis as everybody said look for symptoms and symptoms is subjective and so many people feel that they don't have symptoms but when you inquire about how much they walk what they do what they been doing before what they not to be to do now those things will give you a insight into all symptoms sir most patients when they come along asymptomatic but they don't know they having a symptom age is something we look into it the sts score looking for comorbidities looking for other issues like kidney disease diabetes and other issues to look for the sts score the failed index to see whether are we doing a right thing to put a valve in these people and finally finally when all the things goes inside then we go for a further imaging to look for a suitability of tabor so before all these things we look at the uh, the indication and also looking for whether we can we should go for tabor or not and then we finally go for suitability of tabor so uh, as i said there's a lot of uh, online sts scores now we go for low risk high intermediate risk mainly the risk the risk scoring is not a big thing because a lot of low risk people are also having uh tower done in us nowadays so we need to look at individual patients needs the patient needs also been taken into consideration nowadays so but something to have an idea how what is the risk going to be involved in these procedures the team as i said we is very important to have a team and that matters a lot and uh, me and dr sangdeval has been together last 7 uh, 7 uh, years and we have done all valves in the heart uh, starting from tower pulmonary valve uh, mitral valve and tricuspid valve and the, the success in us is basically the team we had surgical surgical team and the and the anesthesia team and all the people involved so quickly going through what do you mean by uh, patient focus approach by multidisciplinary approach we can patient selection procedure planning patient treatment and the post operative care can be taken and the heart team is very important and uh, what does the effective heart team means lot of papers been published regarding heart team the reason why lot of publication of heart team is because this is a very complex issue needs not only one man decision it needs the entire team to sit in and decide what are we going to offer to this patient are we going to do the right treatment and how we going to follow them up what are what are the steps involved before what are steps in during procedure and post op all they should be discussed and documented and also discussed with the patient in detail before we go for a procedure so um, it's basically a, a total shift where interventional cardiologists and surgeons work as partners and make sure we offer the right treatment and uh, we need to have a multidisciplinary approach um, we need to have a, a coordination of procedures and protocols and logistics we need to have each one identified as people to do that procedure so that we have everybody aware of what's going on the whole team knows what's going on so that we can give the uh, proper uh, you know um, 
um, quality of care for these patients. Particularly when something goes wrong, we have a system in way we can bat on this one. For example, if some in a, in a, a pericardial tampering happens, or you know we have an place valve, we have a system in place so that you know we anticipate all the issues and we know what we're going to how we're going to act on, and all the team members should be aware of what's happening so that this procedure, although been said that you know it's, it's simple and stuff but there's a lot of logistics involved once a complication happened we need to work as a team also so as i told that again we need to have a team approach in all this uh, you know, all the referring cardiologists physicians imaging people a valve clinic coordinator everybody sit together and work towards a standardized assessment protocol so the heart team initially was interventional cardiologist, surgeon, and the imaging people sit together. But the TAVA coordinator, I can't stress the importance of TAVA coordinator who coordinates the patient, who is most often physician assistant, who uh, calls the family, makes sure things have been done, approvals have been sought out, and patient knows what's happening. And uh, obviously, we spend a lot of time in research looking at what are we doing for this patient? Are we following them properly? Looking at the data, uh, that's very important to tell the patient how much to follow up and look at the quality of our, our treatment and uh, pre-op palliative care and geriatric medicine and physicians be involved in the entire uh, process of assessing this patient and, and intra-op we look at the cardiac anesthesiology, pre-admission clinic, operate room, cath lab people and provision services are available so that we have a, a plan to act on if anything goes wrong and post-op again we have a plan for discharge and we have a plan for follow-up and we make sure they go into a, a proper follow protocol and we observe them and uh, make sure that you know we are doing the right treatment for them. So that's the entire real heart team. We need to have the entire team in place, all uh, arms in place, so we can offer the pro proper treatment and also follow them up properly. So this is what we do whenever we get a, a valve uh, a referred for IT stenosis. We have the entire team assembled. I look at every aspects of it before we moving on to uh, do what is necessary for the patient. So we do a proper evaluation before any CT angiogram. Look at other data. Look at the look at the uh, data first to see are we having a have a patient in symptomatic IT stenosis. And then we need to look at the con confirmed by the correct surgeons and also the uh, cardiologists to see are we doing the right thing for the patient. Look at the echocardiography values. And then finally, you go on the CT scan, look at the possibility, possibility of tower, and then go on to discuss. So with this sort of idea, I want to make more uh, interactive and uh, ask some questions regarding individual patients. So um, I'm going to uh, discuss a few patients, about five class case scenarios. So um, the patient one is 71 year old lady, class three symptoms, class quite severe AS and echo showed severe LVH. And, um, and that's uh, CT scan pictures. I want uh, oh, Dr. Sengatuvelu to- Yeah. Okay. Dr. Sengatuvelu to uh, comment about this patient as this is a CT scan done. Echo also showed severe LVH. This is a CT scan given to you for a tower, and how would you go about doing this uh, patient? Okay, so so these are all uh, actually in, uh, real situations which we had. So one of our experiences which we have taken and sharing. So this is one of our patients who had uh, a severe idiotic stenosis, a lady, uh, elderly lady with severe idiotic stenosis, uh, with bicuspidic valve. She had come for, uh, uh, she wanted TAVI an evaluation. She had uh, intermediate risk. Uh, but uh, if you look at the CT and the echo showed severe iatric stenosis, and if you look at the CT, there's a bicuspid iatric valve. Uh, there is a huge left ventricular hypertrophy. You can see in the CT very clearly, a uh, huge left ventricular hypertrophy with uh, almost the cavity is uh, very uh, very small, so very obliterated. So she has also has a large septal hypertrophy with septal bulge. So the entire LVOT is uh, compressed. So in this situation, uh, the, 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 the issue is anatomically, it is a very challenging anatomy for TAVI. And more importantly, uh, after the, if we treat the valvular iotic stenosis, uh, this lady probably will also have a subiotic uh, stenosis narrowing with persistent gradient in the left ventricular outflow tract. So uh, th this is a situation where we actually discuss a surgeon. And uh, Dr. Uh, our surgeon, our uh, surgeon, or senior surgeon, Dr. Vijay Shankar is here with us. So let's have his view on uh, how he would uh, 
Uh, what would they be his considerations? What exactly do you mean by considerations, sir? Uh, what the plan on uh, what would you what would you think uh, in this patient when you have both uh, valvular and uh, subiotic stenosis with uh, huge hypertrophy of the ventricle? So this lady is symptomatic and needs uh, aortic valve replacement. Whether it would be a surgical valve replacement or a transcatheter valve replacement is a is a point to discuss. What about her frailty index? How 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 yeah, frail no. is she? No, yeah, she. So she is quite active. She is not very frail. Uh, she can. Uh, she's quite. Uh, she she is quite uh, active, yeah, lady. Surgic as a tech as a surgeon, technically, see, replacement of this valve on and relief of the subvalvular obstruction is not a problem. How much is the analyst? Is around eighteen or nineteen? The analyst, sir. Um... Yeah, it's it's about twenty millimeter analyst. Yeah, definitely we can push in a 19 size tissue app. But understand, but the technique, even though it is technically feasible, these patients will need a little bit longer bypass. And that is the culprit. And that is the one problem which puts this patient into stress. And when it comes to when it comes to TAVI and when it comes to surgery, the TAVI does not make use of the cardiopulmonary bypass, and the and the inflammatory reaction secondary to cardiopulmonary bypass is not there. So most of your patients after TAB do much better. If they, I saw a patient sitting down in the ICU reading a newspaper, a news, a Tamil newspaper. Any Tamilian who reads that newspaper early in the morning is doing well after any form of intervention. So <clears throat> if the patient is willing for a little bit higher risk, yeah, surgery is not a problem. But if she's willing for a low risk and <clears throat> much Dr. easier. Your, your views, Dr. Aravinda, what would you do in this kind of anatomy? It's a little bit dilemma, Dr. Sangatvelu. I think uh, I like the surgeon's comment that uh, I'm glad that he respects the value of TAVAR and the cardiopulmonary bypass. For me, the bicuspid is the biggest issue because the LVH, I'm really hoping once you fix the aortic valve, it may get better. Okay. The second thing is after you fix the aortic valve uh, with uh, TAVAR or SAVAR, you still have the option of going back and doing alcohol septal ablation if you need it which may not work in this case because it's not asymmetric hypertrophy. It looks like a systemic hypertrophy, but I'm hoping with ACE inhibitors and this uh, LVH may get better. But uh, I agree with the surgeon. If, there, if the patient is not frail because it's a bicuspid and it looks like bulky calcification may benefit from surgery than a TAVAR. And uh, yeah. maybe leave the septal uh, reduction to another day because that's another battle to fight. I think the surgeons in India have good experience, but in US, everything gets downloaded to only Mayo Clinic. Non-Mayo Clinic or non-high uh, academic centers don't have much experience with uh, reduction of the sep septal uh, thickness. That could be an issue because uh, their uh, morbidity mortality goes up. I would say if the surgeon is comfortable just to do an AVR, go ahead, do it and wait for the rest of the problems. But yeah, if patient yeah. and surgeon thinks high risk, then balloon expandable well then is uh, self-expanding yeah. in this case. Uh, thank you. I think this patient was uh, sent for surgery and he did, he did very well. Okay, we'll move to the next patient, please. Move on, next patient. So the patient two, 16-year-old diabetic, hypertensive, severe symptomatic atosinosis. He had a severe symptoms. And she had a severe degenerative aortic valve disease with calcification, aortic valve area of 0.4. But she had a good function of LV and STS score is low, 1.8. And uh, what we saw on um, uh, coronary artery, um, heavy calcified acetylene aorta, which was seen in an angio. And that's what the CT scan showed, uh, heavy calcification of aorta, uh, entirely uh, calcified like a postal aorta. And uh, anterior posterior proportion is calcified. And uh, although it's a low risk, uh, you can see how calcified the outer looks like. And this is a case we again discussed in our meeting. And um, I would uh, ask Dr. SVS to comment on this postal aorta, how difficult it will be for surgical replacement if you want to go for this uh, postal aorta. Uh, thank you, Dr. Butto. Yes. Dr. Butto, I don't see, uh, I won't consider this as a totally calcified aorta here. There yes, are sir. areas okay. of there are areas where I softening softened areas. So, but they are okay. dangerous entity. <laughs> now, a porcelain mm. aorta is characterized by heavy calcification of the ascending aorta extending into the into the uh, into the arch. The problem yes, with this is embolization and stroke, which causes a lot of perioperative mortality and morbidity. Now, in these patients, 
definitely a lesser risk procedure like TAVAR would be ideal because we don't want these patients to have a stroke and that's one, one thing which even our enemy, enemy should not have. Well, let's not, <clears throat> at the same time, let not the audience think that these patients cannot be operated. Definitely they can be operated with a slightly higher risk than a normal aorta and, a <clears throat> and morbidity. And the newer invention interventions like the left ventricle apico left ventricle apico aortic conduits are now becoming popular. It's like the old wine in a new bottle. Now with the surgeons more becoming familiar with the left ventricle assist device, like dealing with putting a process in the left ventricle, these these <clears throat> these technology this technology is becoming more and more popular. The other tech other way of doing this is if there is surgery, we may have to resect the ascending aorta. And then, and then replace the replace the aortic valve. All this carries longer bypass time, and possibility of embolization, and possibility a possibility of uh, uh, morbidity, increase in morbidity. So, in my opinion, if you can do a simpler procedure, reduce the morbidity and mortality, nothing like it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's what we all discuss. I think, as you said, surgery is a possibility here also, but in compared to surgery and uh, TAVR, we felt that TAVR would carry a slightly less risk here than the surgery. So we, we went for um, we went for uh, um, uh, a self-expandable valve here, and we published this one in our uh, experience in, in, in Heart Journal. Basically, this lady did well after this uh, Evlutar uh, implantation, and she's been doing well. You want to add up anything, Dr. Sengkwil? No, she, because of the increased risk of stroke, we had to use a carotid protection and also yeah. we used the yeah. coronary protection. Yeah. And I think uh, we treated this uh, yeah. with a self-expanding valve. Yeah. 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 So moving on to patient three, again, a 73 year old male, uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus, had all uh, comorbid like kidney disease, severe AS, and a high STS score of 9.3. And uh, she has been having frequent admissions with heart failure. So, this is basically a high risk patient with uh, this is a CT values. Look at the diameter and also your coronary ostium, and uh, look at everything as a as a whole. Femoral arteries are good size. The coronary ostia are, are, are nicely uh, at 16.8, 16.4, and we have good diameter. Looking at other values, um, not that heavily calcified valve, and um, its uh, analysis is also good. And, we, and LBOD is not narrowed down, and um, it it looks like a very very uh, not a um, very high risk for TAVR. And um, we went for a um, TAVR here. We discussed in our meeting, uh, in our uh, uh, hearty meeting, and we felt it, all parameters looking like a, it's a less risk TAVR. And this uh, uh, lady had uh, uh, said this man had a um, bone expandable valve and doing well. Anything to add upon this patient, Dr. Sengwin? We, we go ahead, Motu. I think so, uh, really the high so risk patient, the high risk patient, well, clearly a TAVI is yeah. a good choice. Yeah. yeah. So this again, one more uh, lady is on your country old with class three symptoms. I had a, a critical left main bifurcation lesion. That's something uh, we, we saw in the angiogram and uh, also had severe AS and symptomatic STS, high STS score. And um, this is a data of uh, uh, the um, uh, CD, CD data showing all parameters good enough to go for a TAVR. The analysis is good. There's no much of unequal calcification and um, wide open LBOT. But what we saw is a critical left main lesion here. And uh, the question here is basically whether we, do we treat the left main disease, wait and go for a TAVR or we go simultaneous or we'll do TAVR first or go for left main disease after that. It's something we discussed. And um, can you add up uh, some light on this one, Dr. Sintuil? No, no, I think uh, this view doesn't show left main stenosis. The previous uh, image showed a very critical uh, distal left main stenosis is not seen in this. So she also has, uh, uh, so she also has uh, severe eidetic stenosis. So elderly lady with the intermediate risk with uh, critical left main and severe eidetic stenosis. So what are the options? So we did consider both uh, surgery versus TAVI. And I think uh, considering her risk being high and uh, doing both coronary disease and uh, doing CABG with the AVR increases the risk. 
So we considered to do both PCI and TAVI at the same sitting. Uh, and uh, I think we cannot uh, uh, do TAVI without treating the left main, obviously. So we treated both in the same sitting. Yeah, so that, uh, that was the plan. What did you think, uh, Arvinda? Uh, what do you, what is, you think in this kind of uh, situation? It is, again, a really good case because it opens up both the dialogues should the patient get a three-vessel bypass plus a tab, uh, tab, at least two-vessel bypass for LED, a CERC, and then a tab, uh, AVR versus TAVR. I think uh, surgeon's input was valuable in your case. And uh, if the patient's risk goes up by having a combined AVR and a multi-vessel bypass, I think... Uh, and if the patient wants to have uh, preference also is more towards TAVR, what you did is reasonable, but just we need to keep an eye on that left main uh, issues because yeah. for some reason, if the patient can't take antiplatelet or something, you're going to be dealing with a really bad situation. So this patient actually did both uh, very well. As now in almost a year after TAVI with the, the, with the left main stent, he's doing very well. So we go to the next case, Muthu. So we have, so that's the uh, PCI we did and this I was did both pre and post and uh, good result. And you can see we put a balance span valve with good result. So next case is a typical um, this is a patient, summary of the patient. Next so one. patient five, again, a, a, a 70 year old male, severe AS with mild to moderate AR, completely asymptomatic, uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus. Um, investigation showed severe AS with a uh, peak gain of 79, mean of uh, for 53, and 0.9 uh, iatic valve analysis area. And uh, that's the iatic valve anatomy. So uh, this is a patient we're seeing as OPD. I want Dr. Shalmukh Sundam to, to sort of, you know, discuss and uh, tell how we are going about this case. It's a complete asymptomatic uh, person with uh, severe AS, mild to moderate AR. Um, so how are we going to uh, follow this patient or what are we going to do about it? What do you think, sir? Uh, Muthu, patient is asymptomatic. Completely asymptomatic, sir. Okay. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Nanjit Appa has, uh, you know, touched upon this issue. Um, yeah. I always believe that, uh, you know, when, the, um, when you consider somebody asymptomatic, it doesn't uh, equate with lack of symptoms. Uh, some hide their symptoms. Some are too sedentary to have or experience symptoms. Uh, I think that's very important, particularly when you deal with a, a degenerative um, a disease which manifests in 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th decades, um, we can't expect the patient to have uh, mo enough mobility to experience symptoms. So I would rather go with, um, you know, more objective measures apart from gradient, you know, what happens to the biomarkers, you know, what happens to the newer echo modalities, like, you know, the reduction of global longitudinal strain, etc. So I would rather uh, go with those things rather than, you know, just stopping with, uh, you know, presence or absence of symptoms. And um, if you look at uh, uh, one, pub, you know, la very old publication, you know, Dr. Braunwald has mentioned that, um, uh, I think it's in the early 1990s, um, the commonest cause of uh, death in a patient with uh, no symptoms, severe aortic stenosis, is preemptive surgery. Yeah. Because, you know, those days, the uh, risk of sudden death in an asymptomatic individual is much lesser than the surgical risk. But look at now, like, you know, even in my center, the surgical risk is much less than 1%. So if it is so, I don't think, you know, we should really bother about presence or absence of symptoms. I would, you know, particularly when the patient has mild to moderate air, which adds volume overload to the pressure overload, I would certainly, you know, decide more in favor of intervening rather than waiting for the symptoms. Thank you, sir. I think we also did the same thing with mild to moderate AR with the AS also. And we, we actually referred 72 years of age with all this criteria, we actually referred for a tower for this uh, gentleman. So next is a patient, uh, is 63 year old, slightly younger patient, male, severe AS, again, um, had rheumatoid arthritis, uh, had a cancer, was penis and operated, progressed degeneration of hiatic valve, completely asymptomatic, he says, and he got some SC pressure and TV immersion, natural leads, Echo shows severe S and mild AR with normal LV function. So, but you can see that pressure gain is 125, is more than five meters per second. So, um, and this iatic valve anatomy. I want uh, Arvinda to uh, comment about this patient. The patient says he's asymptomatic, but he had uh, rheumatoid arthritis also. So, um, and uh, what do you think uh, with this sort of a high gradient across the valve? Would you wait or would you? subject to uh, CT scan and think of uh, doing a tower or surgical valve, whatever you feel. 
In this patients, depending upon how bad the rheumatoid arthritis is, maybe that's what is causing his limitation of his symptoms. I would try my best to make him walk in the clinic itself for a six minute walk, if not at least maybe a bicycle, something to say he's symptomatic. I would assume with the main grant of 63, uh, of course, I'm maybe old, but my tower experience is only past eight, nine years. So I've not seen a patient who's got this much mean gradient and having no symptoms. But I'm obviously here, other colleagues of mine have more experience and they might have seen, but big gradient of 125, it's hard to believe that he won't have gradient. So I would try to elicit a gradient at least and then see the frailty with the rheumatoid arthritis. If he's too frail, get him down for TAVR. But if not, a uh, mean gradient of more than five, most surgeons will be willing to operate uh, if there is at least an LV dysfunction. Thank you. I think the important point here is uh, because of the limitation of movement, uh, particularly in a patient like this with rheumatoid arthritis, it is very difficult to elicit symptoms. And we, we can't go only by symptoms. And I, I think, as you rightly said, we have to put these patients on a, a, a six-minute walk test. And then, uh, if possible, if it is, that is not possible, I think it is uh, important to see the, the progress of this uh, narrowing. And if it is uh, progressing very fast, it's better to uh, preemptively treat this patient with the TAVI. I think that's what we did. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, that is a nice uh, case to know, uh, just not go by symptoms uh, in such situations. Okay, moving on. So basically what we learned all these things is learning who not to treat, basically what to treat, whether to intervene a surgery or tower or not to treat. This should be discussed in a, in a heart team meeting. Are we doing the right treatment for this patient? And are we uh, not uh, doing something which is not necessary? And something we take a decision at the time of our heart discussion. So in conclusion, a um, lot of uh, randomized trials have shown that TAVR as a preferred option for many patients who, who are uh, in, in, the, in more than 65 years old, but we are moving towards low risk patients also. Cha choice of TAVR and SAV should be individualized, individualized choice taking into account anatomic consideration, age, the disease which are coexisting, and uh, as well as patient preference has been given a choice nowadays. And heart team concert supreme, everybody has to sit together and do the right thing for the patient. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muthu Kumar. Um, Dr. Sengar, why don't you show some, uh, you know, cases from your collection and, uh, you know, uh, educate us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, I'll share my screen. Can you, Muthu, Muthu can you... Uh, yes, sir. Please? Well, Muthu is setting up, I want to tell is, uh, this is a great uh, subset of patients Muthu presented. One tool that may be of benefit is ACC has a free app called uh, Tower Risk. What we mean by that is just like in STS, we have a risk scoring for TAVR patients also. I've not been using it much, but we're trying to retrospectively look at our database. Quickly, for example, we had a 46-year-old morbidly obese patient with uh, bicuspid aortic valve and severe mitral regurgitation with MAC, came with cardiogenic shock on ECMO. And the surgeons would not touch because they said the STS score was 50. And uh, not knowing better, you know, for me, everything on the wall looks like a nail. I wanted to try to see if I can help her. On the ECMO, I did a TAVR with a, bio, with a, bio, with a, bio process, with a balloon expandable valve and the patient did well. Even we went ahead and did a TMVR on that lady to treat the MAC. But no matter what we did, 30 days stay in the hospital, we just couldn't get her off the vent. Finally, the family called off the care. I went back to calculate the TAVR risk in there. Just to do the TAVR, the risk was 46% mortality. That's a very high mortality, no matter what we do. But uh, my mind was fixated on the age 46. Can I get her out of the ECMO? You know? So looking back at this, it's always easy to comment. But prospectively, like Muthu said, keep the patient at the center. Probably the outcomes are always better. And uh, one thing with the TAVR uh, I can tell is the minute I get comfortable that I've done this many TAVRs, that I've done this complex procedures, we can get through. I have a disaster on the table, which makes me feel humble. And then as again, going through with uh, multi-speciality and also choosing the right uh, treatment option uh, keeps me humble always. Thank you, Dr. Arvida. Thank you. So, uh, so I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So... Uh, my topic would be uh, tailoring TAVI therapy to patients' need. Uh, as uh, we learn TAVI and we slowly progress to more complex cases, 
Uh, we also learned uh, how to do TAVI and how to modify the TAVI according to the patient's need so that we can reduce uh, risks and uh, complications. So the whole idea is to get the TAVI valve in the desired location with minimal or no gradient, with no aortic regurgitation. That is the whole aim of doing a good TAVI for a patient who is very suitable and need for TAVI. But uh, how do we tailor make to such to individualize uh, strategies for that specific patient, uh, it's very important uh, to reduce complications. So you need to uh, really anticipate uh, what complications can arise in that particular patient and then plan a strategy to avoid them. So as we all know, there are risks of paravalent leak or annular rupture or coronary occlusion or maybe a peripheral complications or a stroke. And so we need to clearly know the anatomy uh, before we, we proceed with the TAVI. So it's a lot of planning as we discussed earlier. So the patient's anatomy, it's very, very important. And using a CT scan, uh, I think it was clearly mentioned by Nehar and others. So clearly a CT scan helps us to understand the anatomy. We know the aortic root anatomy is very critical to plan a TAVI. The aortic root, which consists of the LVOT, the annulus, uh, the, the sinus of Valsalva, where the coronaries originate, uh, is, is an important area where we need to probably study and plan the amount of calcification present, the size, exact size. We need to assess the morphology of the leaflets. All that we need to clearly understand and, and also important to understand the peripheral anatomy. So let's go step by step and uh, see how we tailor make uh, for specific patients. And we know that calcium is an important determinant of success. We know that there is some amount of calcium is very essential to anchor the TAVI valve, uh, because unlike the surgeon, we just have to anchor the valve without any suture. So we need to have some amount of calcium. So if, suppose there is some amount of heavy calcium or uneven distribution of calcium, it can also lead to problems such as uh, either uh, inadequate expansion of the valve and also paravalve leak. And sometimes when the calcium is extending down into the left ventricle outflow tract, it can increase the risk of uh, rupture. So let's uh, go step by step on how we tailor make. Number one, uh, step one is to assess the LVOT uh, thoroughly to look for calcium. So we, by CT scan, one can see some calcium in the analyst. Uh, it sometimes can extend down into the left ventricle outflow tract. So we can see the, uh, very clearly we can see it in the CT scan, which can also be uh, assessed by calcium scoring and clearly assessed by to, to which extent the calcium is extending down. Also in the, uh, the short axis, we could see the calcium as seen in the left ventricle outflow tract. So by looking at the amount of calcium, uh, we can decide, uh, we can probably don't aggressively size the valve, use a larger size. Uh, this uh, calcium can lead to rupture. And similarly, the choice of valves, uh, one can think of as a self-expanding valve or sometimes a bottom expander valve. As you can see, if the valve should be properly sized, so tailor making the size is critically important. And if you oversize these valves, it can cause rupture see uh, they can uh, rupture and cause a uh, perforation if the valve is oversized. So when you have particularly a heavy calcium in the analyst uh, extending down to LVOT, one need to be very cautious in uh, sizing. So in the presence of rheumatic aortic stenosis, as we did have some cases where we need to treat it with TAVI, the challenge is there is no or zero or very minimal calcium in rheumatic aortic stenosis. We did a couple of patients and we did publish a rheumatic aortic stenosis treated with TAVI here, the problem is uh, there is no calcium, and hence we need to oversize the valve so that the valve anchors with minimal calcium. So here we had to a little bit oversize. So uh, so the, the next important step is to uh, see if we, to, to re reduce the risk of paravalla leak. Uh, the situations, if there is a calcium nodule uh, sitting in this uh, cartoon, you can see there is a calcium nodule sitting in, and eccentrically in, uh, here in the calcium. So the calcium will not allow the valve to fully expand and hence there'll be a space which can allow the, the, the blood to leak back. So this is an aortic leak, uh, which is uh, related to uh, in, uh, to under-expanded valve, uh, which is caused by the eccentric calcium. Or if, uh, if we choose a smaller size of the valve, uh, like in this example, the size is small, then uh, the, there still may be a paraval leak and the valve risk of embolization is also there. So sizing is a very important aspect to consider when we want to uh, choose the correct size. Uh, next step is to look for the risk of coronary risk uh, of obstruction. We know that coronary arteries are very close to the analyst, and one we need to know the 
the height of the coronaries, which can be measured using the CT scan. And if the coronary heights are very low, or if the, the sinuses are very narrow, uh, the native leaflets, when uh, during implantation, can push the leaflets, the native leaflets, into the coronary and cause obstruction to the coronary. So we assess it more accurately and then plan. Uh, when during the TAVI, we sometimes keep a guiding catheter and a stent inside the coronary artery to, prove, to, to tackle the complication in case uh, we, it results in coronary occlusion. So coronary occlusion is a dreadful combination uh, after uh, during TAVI and can uh, and cause catastrophic problems. So you need to be very careful to assess the risk and accordingly plan uh, to prevent this kind of complication. So the step four, it is to uh, reduce the risk of vascular access complications. Again, this is one of the important uh, considerations in TAVI because uh, the, anal the, the size of the peripheral arteries are very important. The TAVI devices are bulky and it needs to be taken to the femoral artery. There are uh, many other approaches in case the femoral arteries are not suitable or very small or we have severe disease, atherosclerotic disease, the femoral iliac arteries, then one can consider other exercises like uh, subclavian arteries or in the carotid or many other approaches including transcable approach through the IVC. But uh, very often, uh, majority of the cases, we, we use the transfemoral approach and it's particularly important to assess the size of the uh, femoral arteries, the iliac arteries, and also whether there is a tortuosity or there is amount of calcification. So depending on the presence of these features, we decide the valve type as well as the valve uh, size uh, so that it can be taken across through these femoral arteries. So the other next step is to device uh, choice, device selection. Again, there are several types of valves. Which are, uh, this is a self-expanding valve, uh, balloon expandable valves, as well as mechanical valves. So uh, we commonly use a balloon expandable and a self-expanding valve. So to the, for uh, extreme uh, calcification in the LVOT, extreme calcification, one can consider a self-expanding valve, but also can consider a balloon expander valve with slightly uh, sized uh, uh, exactly or not uh, avoiding oversizing, one can use uh, a balloon expandable valve. So we use CT to look at uh, many other features, which is annular size, the coronary, where the coronary heights. We also know that the patients who have severe coronary artery disease post TAVI uh, to treat these, uh, uh, particularly younger patients who develop coronary artery disease later on, the self-expanding valves, there may be some challenges, but still can be done. But the uh, balloon expandable valves is much easier to, uh, to engage and treat the coronary artery disease later on if they, if they develop uh, coronary artery disease. So the consideration is given to all these factors to decide uh, uh, which valve is best suited for that particular anatomy of that patient. Also, we know that the aortic valve is in close proximity to the uh, conduction system. So uh, the so that is important because there is there are risks of uh, developing com heart, complete heart block and conduction disturbances leading to the necessity for pay permanent pacemaker uh, in about uh, eight to ten percent of patients. Uh, so we can predict to some extent. Uh, for example, uh, we can have some a CT scan can show if there is a narrow left ventricular outflow tract, or uh, we can look at even sometimes ECG can help uh, help us to know if this patient has a right bundle branch block. Uh, they have a very high risk of uh, developing a complete heart block after TAVI. Or if they have first degree heart block, they have a higher risk. So we can uh, predict who are at higher risk and plan uh, uh, particularly to uh, plan a higher level of implantation. As Dr. Uh, uh, Aravinda was pointing out in his talk, uh, there are a few uh, new techniques like cusp overlap te technique where we can implant the valve higher level. So the, the more deeper level implantation increases the risk of conduction disturbances and if we position the valve high, the risks of conduction disturbances are going to be much lower. And uh, next step is to consider the risk of stroke. And uh, we know that stroke is an important but an unpredictable complication after TAVI. And the number of the number of causes for stroke, but uh, it may be related to the procedure, maybe ischemic, maybe because of the embolism related to the device or calcium, uh, which can go and cause stroke. So we have uh, cerebral protection devices. Uh, which are now uh, uh, shown to be very effective, particularly because there are a number of debris which are uh, captured after the uh, after the TAVI, and also in the CT scans and MRI have shown a number of small infarcts post TAVI. So, considering uh, that uh, cerebral protection devices are particularly helpful uh, when a patient has a large amount of calcium in the annulus or atherosclerotic iota, 
or if the patient has a bicuspid valve, they are having a higher risk of stroke and can, can be and we considered for uh, protection devices. So the procedure is still customized uh, in some situations, uh, depending on the, the hardware selection is customized, depending on whether it's a large left ventricle, there are uh, sizes of wires can be tailor-made. The associated coronary disease can be, again, planned according to the patient. They have severe uh, left main, like how we, uh, we treated in the previous, Dr. Muthu showed a case. So similarly, we have to treat the left main before we do the TAVI. And whether we do pre-dilatation or do a direct implantation of the valve, Again, if a patient has a severe uh, calcium or has a bicuspid valve, it is better to do a pre-dilatation. In many of the situations, we now do direct deployment without doing a balloon dilatation. So as I told you, the valve positioning is very crucial and we try to aim to achieve a high implantation as possible, particularly in bicuspid valves and in patients who have a higher risk for conduction disturbances. So bicuspid valve is on uh, one area where we have uh, many other important considerations which I will uh, I can I will explain this slide where you can see uh, there may be eccentric calcifications. The coronary arteries may be lower. As Neha told, there may be iotopathy. So it is more challenging when they also have a uh, risk of paravalve leak and the risk of uh, uh, also rupture because of the heavy calcium in the bicuspid valve. So we use a different sizing method for bicuspid valve. Normally, the sizing is done at the annular level. But for bicuspid valve, we also look at the commissure. So intercommissural distance is also useful. Uh, the calcium, in the, if it is present in the raffe, it may not allow the, the valve to expand well. As you can see in this example, the expansion of the valve is not circular because the calcium at one side is preventing the, uh, the valve to expand uniformly. And this can call distortion of the valve. So in bicuspid valve, it's uh, important to size the valve Sometimes you, the, the, the aortic root can be either a par type where it can narrow down and be more uh, more wider uh, in the upper in the, in the higher side. So it can either it can be tapered sometimes where the narrowing can be uh, at a supra annular level. So it is critical to understand where we will get the anchor point for the transcathetic valve. So we measure both the the intercommissional distance as well as the the, the annular uh, distance and then decide whichever is smaller. So uh, most of the time it is a, a flare type where we have the annulus which is smaller uh, than the supraannular area. So I'm going to quickly show you a case how we tailor make uh, and treat this as a patient who treated and done a live case uh, recently. So this is an 82 year old male. Uh, so clearly uh, with multiple risk factors, diabetic, diabetes and hypertension. This patient presented with acute pulmonary edema uh, with severe iodic stenosis. Uh, so clearly, an elderly man with severe iodic stenosis with recent pulmonary edema uh, and, uh, with moderate ejection, uh, LV dysfunction with ejection fraction of 35%. Uh, clearly, they have a, uh, this patient is high risk uh, for uh, surgery. And uh, surge, uh, definitely after the discussion of the heart team, clearly TAVI was the best option for this patient. So we did evaluate this patient for uh, TAVI and uh, the CT scan was done. So what do we look at the CT scan and how do we customize uh, TAVI treatment for this patient? So we look at the uh, CT scan. We would like to look at the the uh, the, the coronary heights, uh, which are 10.4 and 15.6. So, and uh, when we have a coronary height which is 10.4, uh, it is it is uh, about 10 is uh, acceptable. But uh, it, we also have to look at the 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 sinus of valsalva diameter. So, the sinuses are wide, then we don't have an issue. Even if the left coronary diameter, the height is less than 10 millimeters. So the sinuses here, if you look at the sinuses, the left sinus is 31, and uh, right is 29.6, and non-coronary 31.3. So clearly there are large sinuses, and we look at the valve uh, uh, diameter. So we look at both the perimeter and the, uh, the area. And for balloon expandable valves, we look at the area-based diameter. And based on that, the area is 367 millimeter square. So one can calculate the annulus. So what we can clearly see here is a bicuspid valve. And uh, so bicuspid valve, again, we need to look at the intercommissional distance. And also, uh, you can see the analyst, there's not much of calcium uh, into the LVOT. So clearly, the risk of LVOT obstruction is not there, um, not much there. So we consider we can have both self-expanding valve and the balloon expandable valve uh, in this case. So we look at the coronary heights. Uh, we already discussed the left coronary is 10. So another important consideration is to look at the femoral and the iliacs and the iota. Uh, as you can see, there is not a much amount of you no know, tortuosities in both the uh, left and the right femoral and iliac arteries. 
the, the calcification, you can see there are uh, some calcifications which can be seen. But the calcium, if it is concentric, if it is 360 degree, then it is more difficult to take the valve in. And if it is a longer segment, if it is a long calcium involving 360 degrees, uh, it, is, uh, it is often a challenging situation to take the valve. But here you don't have a concentric calcium. And there are some, uh, the diameter here, it is around 6.6 uh, uh, .6 into 4.6. So these areas may be sometimes difficult to take the valve in. So we look at the coronary arteries. Coronary artery doesn't have much of a disease, both in the left and the right coronary arteries have very minimal CAD. So to summarize here, we have a, a bicuspid valve. It's actually a type 2 bicuspid valve with fusion of the left and the right coronary cusps. The annulus is 383. So there's a thick uh, calcium here in the non coronary cusp. So this is a flare type. So based on that, we choose, choose the annulus diameter to choose the valve size. So here we plan to take a 23 millimeter balloon expandable valve. So I'll just quickly share uh, the, how we did this case. Actually, this is a, you can, you can see the echo, which shows uh, clearly a bicuspid valve. There is a heavy calcium in the non coronary leaflet. So uh, we are uh, just uh, starting the procedure where we have crossed the aortic valve. There is a pigtail in the, in the non coronary sinus. So we are measuring, uh, we are putting a pigtail uh, through the pigtail. We are putting a stiff wire uh, into the uh, left ventricle. Now we have customized wires, which we can either shape it or we can use, here we use a, a extra small safari wire, which are, which are wires, which are now have extra small, small and large. So we can uh, take according to the size of the left ventricle. So as you can see, the calcium is huge, a bicuspid valve. So a strategy clearly uh, in this patient is to do a pre-dilatation. Uh, clearly uh, uh, in this kind of calcium with a bicuspid valve, uh, the TAVI valve uh, will not cause a circular, a good expansion. Sometimes it may be even difficult to cross. Uh, so the other considerations in an elderly male is to think of using a, a carotid protection device. Uh, consideration is also to look at the femoral arteries which are borderline. So in this situation, sometimes we place a safety wire from the right side to the left side uh, so that we can, um, uh, in case of any difficulties, uh, we can always uh, treat the femoral arteries if the sizes are small. So we customize all these uh, depending on the patient's uh, need. And after that, uh, we do a pre-dilatation. As you can see, the stiff wire is inside. The, you can see the non uh, cusp. We have the tra transesophageal echo. This patient is uh, treated with the, by, by gentle anesthesia. So we have, uh, 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 we have the PE probe and we could see the TE here. Uh, so we are uh, we are now taking the uh, balloon, uh, preparing for balloon dilatation. So let me move a little forward. So 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 this is a balloon uh, which is being advanced down, and uh, we do a, we are going to do a rapid pacing, uh, followed by balloon ex uh, balloon inflation of the balloon. So uh, now uh, uh, now we're going to do a rapid pacing. The temporary pacemaker is already there. So uh, so you can see that rapid pacing has started. The pressures have dropped. And uh, it's now you have a flat line, and then we the inflate to the balloon, uh, and uh, then we deflate, and we stop pacing. And once we stop pacing, you can see the pressures are coming up. Pressures are gradually coming up, and the rhythm is coming back to normal. So once uh, this is done, uh, now we uh, we keep the maintain the wire in the position and remove the balloon. And then we took a 23 millimeter valve, which is uh, we we already decided uh, based on the CT. So here it's, it's a balloon expandable valve. Uh, so let me move forward. So this is a valve which is being taken. Uh, so uh, and, uh, so this is a my valve. Uh, a 23 millimeter valve, uh, which is which is advanced uh, uh, through the uh, femorals and the iota, and you can see that it is being taken through the arch, and uh, we are actually flexing here. You can see uh, we are we can move the the flexion and the which will allow the valve to pass through the iota without uh, hurting the iota. So what we do is when we pass the valve through the iota, we gradually do a slight flexion. So, which is possible by uh, small maneuvers at the handle. So that way, we would not scrape any uh, atherosclerotic debris and uh, and reduce it to reduce the risk of stroke. So once we go there, we cross, uh, we cross the, into the annulus, and then uh, there's a 23 millimeter valve which we have crossed, and then we do a 
uh, start doing a rapid pacing. So this is again we we are checking the position, uh, by making sure uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, there is a mark central marker is quite exactly at the level of the analyst, which is guided by the the pigtail, which is uh, we are going to deliver some contrast to the pigtail. So we are able to position the valve in place based on the uh, iotogram. And then now we are doing a rapid pacing. You can see the blood pressure coming down. There is a rapid pacing going on. And then at that time, we, we check the position. And when the position is good, we start gradually. You can see Dr. Muthu inflating the valve. Uh, he is inflating the valve gradually. We're positioning the valve rather than place. And we fully inflate the valve. And then um, we wait for a full five seconds and then deflate the balloon. And once we deflate the balloon, uh, we will we we have to watch for the uh, pressure to come back, and you can see the pressures have come back, and the heart rate is uh, it's, it's it's come down. So the rapid spacing is stopped, and we remove the the balloon, the, the deflated balloon, and then immediately we look at the uh, the, the transition visual echo, and also the gradients. Uh, we can look at we can do a hemodynamic measurement. So this patient you can see the valve uh, is circular you can see the valve the new valve in place in the short axis now you get clearly seen uh, eccentric uh, opening of the bicuspid valve now you can see a, a now circular orifice uh, after the valve implantation and uh, uh, we are doing going to do a check angiogram and uh, in, uh, in fact no, there is no paraval leak at all and the gradient was very low so we get a great result for this patient you can see an iotogram the coronaries are flowing very well there is no gradient there is no paraval leak and uh, also, uh, very importantly, this patient who had LV dysfunction, uh, in fact, as you can see the left ventricle now, the function is improved. It's instantaneously, the ejection fraction has improved to almost 45 to 50 percent, which is uh, actually seen immediately after the valve uh, implantation. So basically, uh, this elderly man with a high risk for surgery with a severe bicuspid valve with the eccentric calcium, we were able to customize and uh, plant TAVI with a 23 millimeter balloon expandable valve and uh, got away with a great result uh, uh, with the TAVI. So, so it's important. The message what I would like to give you is to it's important to take every individual patient and uh, individualize and uh, may, may take give importance to planning with the proper CT assessment and good heart team discussion and to take every steps uh, uh, and plan every steps. So that we get a, a good result and we anticipate the complications so that we can be completely prevented. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Sangotwil. Now I think uh, uh, we can have uh, any uh, floor discussion if somebody has got any chat box discussion. Otherwise, uh, from the panelists, we can ask questions. Aravind, uh, do you have any questions for... Uh, Singo Tuvel or Nihar Mehta or uh, any of your views? A really outstanding presentation of the last case because uh, that showed how careful planning team effort can get a good outcome because uh, the careful inflation even by Muthu to stop just before fully inflating was really valuable because we all have seen um, in a hasty way and uh, planning without planning can get into disaster and choice of the valve selection, everything was really well done. And uh, it's very nice to see that uh, the lessons we learned the tough way has been negated and uh, good planning is in bold. The participant had some discussion I just posted. I don't know if this is the right yeah, answer. I saw, I saw, yeah, I saw your answers, uh, you know, your questions answers. Okay, now uh, as a physician, because now we are all uh, intervention cardiologist discussion. As a physician, I have a few questions for uh, Nigar Mehta. Nigar Mehta, as a physician, um, still do you think uh, aortic stenosis can be diagnosed clinically? And can you make tight aortic stenosis, aortic sclerosis, and uh, uh, what sort of uh, you know, uh, clinical exam will give us as a, as a physician? Uh, yes, sir, very much so, because uh, you know, so the murmur of aortic stenosis. It's, it's a very prominent, very well-heard uh, murmur. So a simple auscultation and, you know, sir, because of the Galloverden phenomenon, especially with calcific aortic stenosis, it radiates uh, to large parts of the chest. So uh, if, if not, if, at least 
for every physician we should pick up that murmur and the severity will always be most accurately assessed by 2d echo but um, uh, you know for the more astute physician the peaking of the murmur the later peak is more important the pulse quality the blood pressure the symptoms uh, all these things together will you can very well diagnose uh, aortic stenosis so it's very easy to miss a mitral stenosis sometimes because the murmurs tend to be very soft because of the low gradients but aortic stenosis are loud murmurs you hear them all over so you were talking about a haid syndrome what is it can you uh, throw some more light on haid syndrome is it possible to you know correlate and then come to a conclusion in a clinical setup Yes, sir. So, for example, in older people, very often you see a low platelet count. You see bleeding tendencies. Uh, I'll give you a case example. We had a lady who came to us who was delaying her tower tower for she was eighty three. For two years, she kept saying, "No, I am not ready. I am too old," and so on and so forth. And she one day came with a massive GI bleed. We found platelet counts to be low. We did a, a scopy, a colonoscopy. and we found angiodysplasias a lot of uh, angiodysplasias so uh, this association we still don't know why it occurs but aortic stenosis is known to be associated with these two things uh, acquired von willebrand factor deficiency and these uh, recurrent gi bleeds uh, she's had a tavi now four years later she's not had any single gi bleed again so you do come it's just that we have to associate it you know so that uh, these things do come together yeah another thing you said uh, medical treatment is dismal but still uh, we don't have any uh, any other option in a small village uh, so what type of uh, you know treatment you give for uh, aortic stenosis do you give beta blockers do you give anything extra like you no know, routinely you no know, to at least to save some time you no know, before we refer to sing out to well for one year they have to you know make their uh, home arrangements things like that So I think the, the better thing would be to avoid vasodilators like diuretics, ACE inhibitors, uh, even calcium channel blockers to an extent. Beta blockers would be a better drug. Um, some people say statins, but you know, so there's no real evidence, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's just it's just praying that they don't they don't have some major symptoms before they can reach the tar tarry table. Okay, Arvind Nanjudappa, in your setup. do you show all your cases to your surgeon before you take uh, tavi do you really so get that, opinion so for the sake of heart team approach also we do that second is uh, medicare won't uh, approve like the insurance agents won't approve unless you have one surgeon putting a note to say that why he thinks tavi is a good option and his note sh clearly should mention the sts score frailty and also should mention the reason why he thinks tavi is a good option sometimes we do have maybe out of the year about uh, five to six of them the surgeon is in a fence so we go back to discuss and sit and have it in the patient stable but maybe one to two patients they may say no 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 this has to be surgery not at our but for majority 95 to 96% all of us agree but also we have uh, i'm sure sangat well and you all are doing the same thing we do have a surgeon in the room all the time when we deploy the valve and that's a medicare requirement but also i have done a little bit um, whether it's good or bad i have trained my surgeons uh, one two three so far four of them to do the tavar among them two i can tell you hands on they can do as good job as anybody else can do starting from crossing the wire catheters to putting the valve so once the surgeon himself puts his hand he's not just checking the stock market standing at the behind me or just in the room to say hey can i go can i go because it's just part of a billing when he is involved in access to the finish they take special pride in doing not only the tavar the business comes from the surgeons and i think only dr sangat will know so though i am a cardiologist i work for surgical but, but, department but but arvind, but arvind nanjudappa i will strongly discourage you to do that because over a time you know the surgeons will take over because they are more confident <laughs> than you in dealing things you know so don't do that it will be it'll not it'll not be good for you please not really not really i'll tell you sir why <laughs> i'm, j I'm not, just joking no no i know i know but not really i'll tell you why we i am a cardiologist but i work for surgery i'm not paid by surgical i'm not paid by cardiology department my pay structure comes from surgery i take the call with surgeons and i work for surgery department but 80% of my business comes from surgery surgery itself second thing it adds is uh, there are two or three physicians one of them i can tell you is kendra grab one of the uh, eminent uh, ct surgeons she was trained in one year in structural intervention one year in coronary intervention by martilian himself 
she can do a left main stent like anybody else. She takes the STEMI call being a CT surgeon, but gets her 90% of the procedures. It's TAVR. She's very good in what she does with the TAVR. So there are a few of them. We just right. hired a new young kid also like that, a CT surgeon from Chile, but he's also having him the hospital actually thinks the opposite way. I have an inherent mode to hire these people so that we get more tower, they think. But uh, eventually, what's good for the patient is good for us. You know? yeah, so in India, I think uh, still, uh, surgeons are not coming in to do the procedure. They just uh, give a standby. But they are very hesitant to come and uh, wash and uh, start doing TAVI still. But we do, we do uh, ask them to come. But I think uh, they are still uh, not really into TAVI. Yeah. Sa 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 yeah. Okay. Sanu Sa Sundram. Yeah, sorry. You go ahead, Arvind. Yeah, you want to say something, please. No, no, just wanted to say it will happen even in India. I think uh, younger people like Sangat Vedu and them teaching the surgeons will happen and they will also start getting involved. And I think once the cost of the TAVR comes down, I predict that India will be the leading center for TAVR because of the knowledge, skill set. And I think uh, Nehar mentioned, uh, uh, Mehta mentioned very well, physical exam is where we lack in America. Many of the patients I get on tower based on the echo, and I have myself seen this patient in the clinic, and I feel ashamed that where did I miss this murmur? So in India, that can't happen. They're outright uh, top on the physical exam stuff. So they, they, India will shine in the tower in the future. Yeah, we still use a stethoscope in India. So that means we really examine them clearly. Okay, Sanma Sundaram, when you get a case of aortic stenosis, what will be your approach? You will straight away give it to some good way or will you refer to the surgeon? What will be your uh, you know, approach? How do you evaluate? I think in our country, the cost issue is uh, top priority. I know um, if um, anatomy is not for a surgeon to intervene and if cost is not an issue for the patient, probably like, you know, the tower would be a you know, good choice. Uh, but oh, I think, like, you know, uh, I mean, it all depends upon, you know, uh, where you do your work. Like, you know, um, you know if your, uh, uh, you know, services are towards, um, uh, like, your middle income category, probably you will not be able to uh, convince the patient for a, a travel. You know, that's a, a problem. Okay. Are you convinced uh, with the uh, TAVR versus uh, AVR, I mean, surgical uh, replacement? Yeah, yeah, very, any... much, very much convinced, you know. Uh, it stands in par with uh, uh, okay. surgical AVR, you know, except like, you know, the, uh, the requirement for pacing uh, and the, you know, occurrence of paravalvular leak. You know, these are the small issues. I, I hope, you know, with um, improvement in the design of the valve, you know, th those things will also, um, you know, come down in uh, incidence and match up with uh, surgical AVR. So I suppose you said refer to Sangha to well when it comes to you. post yes. avi do you get uh, any complication, any problem you face after uh, post avi in your patients? No, one is, um, you know, um, during the procedure itself, they will be able to recognize the occurrence of, um, you know, paravalvular regurgitation. You know, Sengotuvel has made, you know, made a specific mention, you know, presence of, uh, you know, calcium is required, but too much of calcium is a hindrance. Um, you know, when the annulus is um, not circular, oval shaped, the occurrence of paravalvular yeah, no, that's one problem. And the second one is uh, the occurrence of uh, AV block. AV block uh, need not occur on the uh, day of procedure. It can manifest in a few days or a few weeks later also. Particularly with the self-expanding valve, uh, the occurrence may be delayed. So you have to be on the watch out. And the third important thing is, you know, the recognition of uh, subclinical valve thrombosis. You know, uh, with the CT scan, we are able to see the presence of, um, you know, thromb small thrombi. Uh, some of them show even restricted valve mobility. That is um, one issue which needs to be sorted out, uh, you know, with more number of patients being done. Uh, Digar, uh, how often you see aortic stenosis with coronary problem also? So if that is the case, how do you approach? Will you submit them for uh, TAVAR and then coronary angio or coronary angio and TAVAR? So we do see, uh, you know, enough number of patients... Uh, uh, in, in literature, it's, it's around 10 to 15 percent of people who do have associated coronary artery disease. And very often when we do the angiogram, we do find coronary disease. Uh, you know, you have to treat the coronary disease at its merit. You know, the, uh, we at least, you know, there are different approaches per different center. But we prefer to treat the coronaries and then do the uh, TAVI because after a TAVI, it's difficult to access the coronaries especially with the self-expanding valve. But um, 
each case has to be taken as per the merit sometimes there are um, uh, uh, coronaries which are too low and you have to intervene early and on the other hand sometimes the coronary arteries may have very minor disease which you can choose to leave alone with uh, and manage with medications is there any uh, correlation i mean uh, congenital bicuspid valve and congenital coronary problems together not Do really not really with uh, with uh, with a bicuspid valve sometimes you have two coronaries coming from opposite ends so the origins of the coronaries may be a bit different but um, uh, that 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 is uh, expected sir but otherwise by and large it's it's quite okay sir sir go to well do you want to add some more point in this any uh, yeah. bicuspid valve coronary problems together yeah so the coronary artery disease again as you said there are some situations where really we need we need to intervene earlier like uh, patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome patients who have left main disease or patients uh, who uh, who cannot tolerate tavi because tavi we do a rapid pacing so to if you have severe disease they may not tolerate so if it is a large vessel important vessel we definitely try to treat it before but very often we find a, a right coronary artery total occlusion or a small branch occlusion distal artery. all these we don't have to worry about because these can be left alone and uh, i think as nayar said uh, we give a lot of other considerations also how we can treat uh, whether we need to treat post avi uh, the choice of the valve whether we use self expanding or bottom expand so many considerations but it's very clear if the patient has a critical disease or acute coronary syndrome it has to be treated before so that is uh, one thing which is very clear and of late uh, number of uh, people having tavi is going up so people will land up with coronary artery disease post tavi so post tavi uh, uh, acute mi so these those patients uh, for the general cardiologists who are not doing tavi regularly they might find it difficult to engage the coronary arteries and treat it uh, with angioplasty particularly when we use a self expanding valve so as the tavi numbers grow i think this uh, treating coronary artery disease post tavi also Uh, will probably people will start learning to do the procedures uh, with different valves so so it is as you have, you need a special skill for the post avi and your coronary yeah. uh, it, 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 it needs a little bit of experience it's not a special skill most of them will be able to do it but only thing they need to be aware and uh, need, need to know what kind of catheters we have to undersize the catheters so they need to know a little bit uh, the, about the valve anatomy and how it is being done so to so it can be easily done but uh, they have to uh, little bit understand how to, how to do it i think i last one question sanmu sundram and we'll go for round and we'll conclude sanmu sundram suppose the patient has got as and also associated hypertension uh, what would be your approach um so like you know uh, i think uh, during our student days you know we were taught uh, if you, somebody with diabetes stenosis or you know an ejection murmur has a uh, significant hypertension severe aortic stenosis is unlikely but i think it's totally wrong now we now realize that severe aortic stenosis can exist with uh, significant hypertension so to quote an example you know even 170 180 mm systolic blood pressure can coexist with um, uh, severe aortic stenosis the second issue is um, uh, the underestimation of the severity of as when you have severe hypertension so it is very essential that you should bring down the blood pressure redo the echo study to estimate the gradient and you know you get the true gradient and the third issue is uh, the occurrence of double load on the left ventricle so like in addition to the aortic stenosis the non compliant aorta due to systemic hypertension adds additional load to the uh, left ventricle so it is very important to recognize this combination as much as 30% of uh, people with severe aortic stenosis seem to have hypertension it's very important uh, yeah uh, yeah that's why i asked you that question um, uh, we'll go around now nigar mehta your final message for all our viewers what good message for all physicians I, uh, who are listening i i think that uh, you know when we started out doing coronary intervention there was a time when the cardiac ot used to be kept on standby and surgeons right now in the tavi room is like that that as the devices are going ahead as we are getting more and more finesse with tavi it's going to be something which is going to be an everyday procedure for most of us hopefully it's it's really the therapy of the future which we have got great exposure to now sir so okay thank you yeah thank you thanks for participating aravinda nanjundappa are you there yes aravinda? sir Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, your final message for all our viewers. But one more, one question also. Do you come across both AS and AA together, and then how do you manage? 
I think the last data is some, uh, from the Tavar data, what uh, Raj Makar published, it's almost in 20%, which I thought was way high. But when you look back, yes, some degree of AI does exist. It's kind of a blessing in these guys because, uh, as Sangatwell was mentioning, not only from the coronary disease, when you have severe aortic stenosis, long term pacing for something like a metronic valve, patients don't tolerate well. So, if I, I've noticed that if they have an AI, it, they do tolerate pretty good. So, AI and AS is becoming a concomitant disease. One more quick point is uh, the 2020 guidelines that was published in ACC has a new criteria. If you have a AS and AI, you could uh, still get the TAVAR done, but still they kept the mean gradients to 40, which was kind of disappointing. Just like in that case, uh, Muthu presented, sometimes when you have AS and AI due to pressure and volume overload, you may not meet the criteria. I think the next guidelines, I'm really hoping that they'll lower that criteria for the 40 millimeters. Okay, your final message to all of us. Again, thank you so much for involving me with this. You know, it's really good to hear from experts and uh, learn a lesson. And uh, I learned a lot of these things more than what I can share. But uh, it, this is a lot of fun. And there's everyday learning to do with the tower. It's not like a coronary. I'm done one time after putting a stand. So look forward to getting participated in more of these things. Thank you all. Yeah, you are always interested in changing things. You have changed your T-shirt. Your T-shirt looks good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, now Sengot will your final comment and your final word. No, Tavi now with so much of trials now with the, the, all the trials is clear that for uh, entire spectrum of risk, whether the earlier we used to consider assess the surgical risk, the surgical risk was very high or intermediate we would consider. But now with the entire spectrum of surgical risk, whether the surgical risk is low or high, Tavi has been clearly shown to be equivalent to surgery. That is one important message. And uh, second, with the current devices and uh, with the current uh, technical expertise, uh, we are able to give a very good outcomes and the long-term durability of the valves have considerably improved and with uh, more and more. And we now have also uh, many options of valves. We have Indian valves, so with, uh, uh, with lesser cost. And so we are able to uh, tailor make and give uh, different types of valves to different patients and uh, also, uh, uh, hard team discussion is what is very important because we need to really tailor make whether the best option for the patient is surgery or uh, uh, or uh, is a tra tra transcathetic aortic valve replacement. Particularly when you have a younger patient, uh, when you have a patient who is less than 75, generally 75 is a cutoff. Above 75, we really consider TAVI as an option rather than open heart surgery. But uh, for less than 75 years, uh, we do really consider surgery as an option. And uh, if a patient with 60, 65, uh, definitely surgery is a great option and unless they have a compelling reason uh, where surgery is uh, not possible or not high risk, uh, we would definitely discuss the option of surgery with the patient and do the best options for these patients. Chanmu Sundram? Uh, uh, I would like to uh, make a mention about the natural history of aortic stenosis. Most of the earlier publications I know, involved patients with uh, congenital and rheumatic aortic stenosis. But what we see even in our country you know, the degenerative aortic stenosis uh, is likely to, you know, dominate as the cause of aortic stenosis. Uh, in my own experience, like, you know, three patients progressed from mild aortic stenosis to severe aortic stenosis in just a period of 12 to 18 months. So, uh, I don't think we should take it easy when we see a, you know, a patient with mild aortic stenosis. That's the word of caution I wanted to mention to audience. Yeah. So I think uh, it was a wonderful uh, webinar with a lot of in inputs, a lot of new information. So what I will uh, tell our physicians, whenever you send a patient and the echocardiogram comes as bicuspid aortic wall, be careful. Uh, do monitoring, do uh, say, uh, periodical screening so that, uh, you know, at one point of time, he may he develop, he or she may develop uh, degenerative aortic stenosis where you love to refer and then get the treatment at the earliest. And uh, regarding another thing, most of the patients are senior patients. So the geriatricians uh, who are attending the program also have a role to assess the priority index. There are so many priority index have come. They say somebody walks less than six uh, meters per uh, hour or minute, then they form, come into the uh, second priority. If they can walk more than that, that means their priority is good, they're fit. So there are so many priority index have come. So I think physicians should learn how to assess the priority and then uh, refer the patient with confidence. So thank you very much, Aravind Ranjitapa, for uh, joining us. And uh, we are very, very useful. And if there's anything else uh, from your side, please send it, send it to us. We'll uh, uh, I mean, inform in the next meeting. 
So all of you, please good night, and we'll see you next week, same time, six thirty to eight thirty next Saturday. Until then, take care, stay safe. Thank you for all your support, uh, the uh, pharma industries and the people who have really supported us. Uh, my special thanks to the Apollo team and the uh, API team who has given us uh, good support. Uh, thank you, Nigar. Thank you, Shankar Sundaram. Uh, thank you, Sangu Devil. And you did a good job. Please continue your good work, uh, Sangu Devil. We are all with you for your uh, complete teamwork. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mumudan sir, for the excellent uh, conduction of this uh, webinar, and uh, we are thankful to the whole medical academy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Good night. Good night. Good night.